Welcome to our Python concurrency tutorial. My name is Santiago, and even though I would love to be in the same room with all of you, uh, sharing you know this tutorial in the same room in Pittsburgh, it's great to try it out in this format. So I'm very happy we can do it in this way. I have adapted this tutorial from the regular version that I have prepared that had a ton of stops in the middle, checking out exercises to this online version. We have separated the exercises in a, sec a second chunk. So we're gonna do all the, the lessons in this recording and then you will have the time to check out the assignments and the projects. So as I told you, my name is Santiago, I'm from Argentina. I work for remoter.com, I actually co funded remoter.com some time ago and it was by acquired by INE. We do courses, so we are used to recording lights and all that. Um, we do online courses, we do data science courses, networking courses, uh, cloud computing courses. Check it out, check us out, INE.com. And right now I am working in my personal time in this library, which is Parallel. The objective is to provide high level, high level interface for concurrent code, even higher level than concur concurrent and futures, which is the library we're gonna see in this tutorial, of course. Um, so let's dive straight into the contents of this tutorial. In the first section, we're gonna do a little bit more of a conceptual understanding of how computer works, computer architecture, what's the role of each one of the pieces we have in a computer, and also the role of the operating system. And then we're gonna uh, get right into coding. We're gonna see multi-threading, multi-processing. We're gonna see thread synchronization. We're gonna see problems with deadlock, the gil, multi-processing, concurrent of futures, and finally, an interaction to parallel, the library that I, I'm working on. Um, but again, it's important first to understand why we need to do concurrency, why we need to write concurrent uh, programs. Let me start first telling you what this tutorial is not about, okay? Because uh, it's important for, for, for me to set the expectations and you know what we're gonna be talking about and what it's gonna be out of the scope. So the first thing is we're not talking about AsyncIO or all these other alternative libraries. It's a different model. It's also useful to create um, to create concurrent code, AsyncIO, um, but it's not the subject of these, this tutorial. This tutorial is a little bit more classic. We're gonna do, do multi-threading, multi-processing, and that's it. Again, AsyncIO is a potential substitute for everything we're doing in this tutorial, but it's not in the scope. We will not be doing low-level programming, thread programming, even though I mentioned something like the fork process or to fork a process, spawn a process, we will not be doing low level programming. Um, this is multi-threading, multi-programming, uh, multi-processing is not uh, a replacement for distributed architectures, all right? So if you have a website, for example, and whenever you get a request, you need to do a couple of things concurrently, usually that's better placed in a job queue, a, a typical, uh, task queue, you know, you can use RabbitMQ or uh, this uh, a, a provided service like SQS. Um, if you're using Django, you can check out Celery, but this is not about that and you should not confuse it. You, It's important to understand the need that you have and what's the right tool to solve that problem. Um, this is not about pipelining, clustering or distributed computing. That's better suited for something like Dask or Spark, in which you have multiple computers processing something in parallel, okay? This is not, this is just one computer, multi-threading, multi-processing, and even in the same computer, you can do G uh, GPU uh, parallelism. This is not about that. You can check that out in rapids.io. It's a very interesting library uh, on top of uh, CUDA, which is NVIDIA, but it has a, a Python, it's a Python API to work with um, data frames, sort of, you know, they have like a, a, a synonym for each of the important data science libraries like Pandas, they have data frames, scikit-learn, they have QML. So it's, it's interesting, but this is not about that either. Um, it's interesting to understand where you're sitting. At. Um, there, there is this very interesting model, very simple, which is you can do, you can have a task that needs to be performed or can be performed in just one core, in a single thread, single process code, just any script, 95% of the tasks you have will probably fall in this category of just one core, and that's great. Um, there is then one step, moving forward one step, it's two to eight cores. 
We could say today, two to 16, 32 cores, something that fits in your computer. You, you have a, this, this intensive task, but you put your computer to run, it takes 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, and it's done. And it's possible to do it in your own computer. So that's the second step. And then you have the other step when you have more than this threshold of CPUs, um, which is, in this case, it says nine plus can be 16 plus, 32 plus again. It doesn't fit a large computer, a large commercial, a commercially available computer. And that's when you need distributed processing. But in this tutorial, we're going to be focusing in point number two, two to a two to 16, two to 32 cores, whatever you can do in your own computer. Why do we need concurrent programming? What's the usage of it? Well, the idea of the evolution of CPUs and computing, it's interesting. This chart, which is great, the source is included in the slides, um, shows how the, the CPUs have progressed throughout the time. And what you will see is that uh, the frequency of CPUs right here, it has tail, right? So it's just all flat in this number of, of uh, megahertz, it's just staying there and it's not moving. CPUs are not getting faster. We have kind of sort of reached um, the maximum level in terms of frequency because of a number of reasons, because um, heating, they overheat, because of uh, power consumption, because they don't fit in the tiny place we have to put them. So we have reached some sort of a limit in there. But what we haven't reached the limit of yet is the number of um, cores. So number of logical cores, you see that it's going up very fast. So in that, in these past 20 years, it has evolved from single core machines to 100 cores, for example, is perfectly possible. When I started doing computing related things, everything was one core. It was crazy to think about two cores, a dual core was a crazy theoretical thing that we knew it existed, but nobody had one. In today, in today's world, it's not crazy to get a 64 logical core computer or CPU, right? It's, it's completely possible. So we're getting into this um, second order of magnitude and that will probably keep increasing. I don't know what's the limit. At some point we will we will hit an asymptote, right? We will hit a, some sort of limit, but so far it's still increasing. So the objective is with concurrent programming is to make use of all these cores whenever it's possible. All right. So we want all these, uh, we want to take advantage of all these cores. The, the speed isn't going up. We have the same speed. So we have to distribute our work into multiple cores, as many cores as possible for that uh, to work. That's the objective. That's why we need um, more, uh, concurrent to write concurrent programs. And usually the tasks will be different for each one of you. I think games are a very good example of a multi-core architecture in which you have multiple things happening at the same time. You have the character running, you have uh, rain happening, you have uh, bullets being fired by enemies. You have multiple things happening at the same time, right? And you can take advantage of all these cores to provide a smoother uh, experience. Let's start with computer architecture. This is the basics, this is point one basics. Let's go back again to the basics, computer architecture. And this is the von Neumann architecture. It's just very plain old, or very standard architectures. All, all our computers today are using this architecture. It's based on a CPU, a memory, um, uh, a memory unit. In this case, it's RAM and IO, everything which is within IO. And it's, again, it's the simplest model we can have. And basically what we have is that given the operations we have in our code or, or, or the instructions we have in our code, they're usually gonna uh, fall, if you want, in each one of these categories. Some operations will be CPU, they will be performed by the CPU. Some other operations will store something in memory. Some other operations will connect to IO. Um, it's important to relate these to the access time of all these resources. So for example, accessing something in the CPU is a lot faster than accessing something in memory or even IO. And I want you to keep an eye on this because this is going to be very important later. 
So, for example, this is a, a very interesting comparison in human relative times. If, a, if one CPU cycle is one second, accessing memory, memory, which we know it's fast, accessing memory takes four minutes. That's how slower, how much slower, how slower is memory compared to CPU. Accessing your, your hard drive, even if it's an, a solid state drive, it's gonna take 1.5 to four days. That's how slow it is. Hard drive access, all hard drive, plate, mechanical drive, it's gonna take one to nine months. Accessing requests, um, network requests can take five years to 11 years, again, relative times compared to a CPU cycle. So this is important. This is gonna be very important when we know what parts of our code we have to make run concurrently. In that case, we're gonna decide if our, if our code is, um, is uh, IO heavy, it makes a ton of network requests, we will know when to parallelize that. Or the same thing if, if, our, if our code is CPU um, heavy, it makes a ton of CPU computations, CPU bound. This is gonna be important later, trust me. We're gonna jump now to the operating system and the role of the operating system. It's very interesting to learn about the history of operating systems and how they evolved. It's very, I, I personally love it. I have read a couple of books and it's very interesting to understand the process uh, the, the humanity took to understand how much we needed an operating system and why. But basically, an operating system is just a program. It's just someone sat and wrote an operating system. It's a program. But what we have understood with time is that Computers are a very precious resource that we can just execute random programs on top, having direct access to CPU, memory, and I.O. It's very common for me to download an application from the internet and run it on my computer. But in my computer also I have a ton of privilege information and Without the operating system, let's imagine for a second that there is no operating system and, and each program you download can just access anything, any resource they want. It's very hard to trust those programs. So that's why we have created operating systems. We have created a layer that sits on top of our hardware, right? So on the right, we have all our hardware, like our precious resources. And we have put a layer in between any random code you can think of that you can execute on those resources. So the operating system is the guardian of those resources. Any, any operation you want to perform is actually going through the operating system and the operating system is gonna have control over that. What memory you can write or what memory you can read, where you can write or read files, etc. that's all part of the, the, the the protective nature of the operating system. And of course, the operating system have many more uh, usages like uh, paging, paginating algorithms and handling disk, and disk drives and, and all those things. In, our, in, our, in, in this case, it's important to understand the protective nature of the operating system. Uh, in order to run your code, the operating system will use the concept of a process. Remember, you can't just execute your code directly. You have to hand over your code and say to the operating system, hey, I wanna run this piece of code. Can you do it for me? And the operating system is gonna put that in what we call a process. So this is our code and the operating system is gonna put it in this, um, right here in this uh, container, which is the whole process, that will contain a separate number of things. It's gonna have your code, it's gonna have a reference, it's actually gonna load your code in memory, it's gonna have a reference there. It's gonna allocate RAM or memory. It's gonna say, uh, this process has these many bytes allocated of memory to use. It's gonna have all the local variables, file scripts, file scripters, sorry, all the things we need to access. So for example, here, we started with x equals one, we incremented it, uh, the operating system is keeping track of that memory. We open a file, we ask the operating system to ask the file for us, and we have a reference to that file descriptor. So the operating system is creating this abstraction, the process, so our code can interact with the system through this process interaction, uh, ex um, abstraction. So whenever we execute code, in this case, whenever you do Python, 
your command, what is actually happening is that the operating system is creating a new process and it's injecting the, your code in there and it's executing that. So you can actually run the same program that you have written, the same .py file, you can execute it in multiple, uh, you can execute it multiple times. You have multiple processes running concurrently in the same computer. That's what we can see right here. So that's, those are all the processes that I have in my computer running after running, after starting all those processes. And again, they're all different instances of those processes. You can see right there, process ID. That means that there is a different instance of each one of these processes. They're all executing the same code, but they are all different uh, processes. So what about process concurrency? And this is the, the very interesting part about uh, learning or about operating system history. Um, at the beginning, let me just go with the slides, but um, let's say we have only one CPU. I, I'm gonna take you back. I'm not that old, but uh, I'm, I'm from an era where there was only one CPU. Let's say you have only one CPU in your computer. That's not what happens today, but let's assume it's what, what you have. We have only one CPU in your computer. One CPU is one worker, just one worker. How many processes can you run in one CPU at the same time? That's the question. Of course, you can run only one task at a time. There is only one worker. You can run only one task. But even when I was a child and I had a one core computer, I still had a interesting smooth enough experience i could play i could play doom for example the first version of doom and i had only one core so i i fire a bullet i move my enemy dies i get fired at so how is that experience happening with only one cpu if the cpu can have process one thing at a time i fire a bullet and how's the cpu just I mean, the keeping track of the bullet and everything else is frozen. I can't move, my enemy can't move. Well, because of what we're gonna call uh, time slicing or the scheduler of the operating system. So even with one CPU, let's keep this, uh, this hypothesis here, we're working with a computer that has only one CPU. Even if there are multiple processes being executed at the same time, the operating system is gonna schedule them in and out right? And it's going to give them a little bit of CPU time to each one of them. It's just one CPU, the operating system is going to claim the CPU, it's going to give it back, it's going to give assign some time to process one, it's going to reclaim it, it's going to assign some time to process two, it's going to reclaim, it's going to assign some time to process three. So it will give you the impression that there are things happening at the same time, when in reality, everything is happening um, not in this, not at the same time, sadly. So in the in our example of a game, a simple shooter in 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 a C, in a one CPU uh, in a one core era, basically you fire a bullet. The bullet travels for a piece of a second. Then the CPU is transferred to a character. Then the CPU is transferred to the enemy, and everything is, is there. It's a very very fast context switching for each one of the, in this case, they're not processes, but yeah, between the processes, there is a very fast context switching, which gives you the impression that things are being run in parallel. And this is the difference between concurrency and parallelism. Concurrency is handling multiple tasks at the same at the same time, not at the same time, literally, that would be parallel, but starting multiple things and have to manage things that potentially can run at the same time. Parallelism is actually when two things run at the same time. In a one CPU computer, you can't have parallelism. You can have concurrency, you can't have parallelism. Um, that's basically the difference with parallelism. So this is what parallelism could look like. Right, so if we go back to this slide, there are no two moments in time when there are two tasks being executed at the same time. There's always uh, the the OS, right, it's changing, switching um, the 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 main CPU, the the CPU, not main, the only CPU, CPU time from process to process, and and this introduces complexities because 
the operating system is also a, process, a program by itself. So whenever the, the moment that the operating system is switching the context of a process, the operating system itself, it also needs some time to run. So that's interesting. Um, so this is a parallel system. We have, this is another um, hypothesis. We have two cores now, we have two CPUs and each CPU is one of these blue lines. And basically what is happening is that now in these moments in time, we have actual parallelism because one core is taking care of this task and the other core is taking care of the other task. So now this is actually parallelism. You will see also that at some point the CPU is idle. This is very common, idle, it's very common. So again, what we're saying here is that the CP, the operating system is the one deciding when each one of the, of the processes will run. It has full authority to which, CP, uh, which process is gonna be run at a given time. And that's a very important thing is, is moving back and forth the processes that can run. Um, the op operating systems, and again, history of operating systems, I'm kind of a nerd on it, but uh, operating systems realized that there were different type of tasks and there were multiple um, time slicing algorithms created in order to understand when a, an operating system should grant uh, access to the CPU to a process or not, when it should uh, schedule it in or out, right? Take it out, or take it in. And basically, there was one big realization that was related to the nature of the task that was being run. Remember our access times? If a process is, is um, CP is IO heavy, you want to give it a ton of CPU whenever it needs it. So whenever the CPU needs, uh, the, whenever the process needs to run an, an IO task, you want to give that process the CPU because you know it's not going to take long. It's just going to fire up the, the request. For example, it's going to say, you give this the process time. It's going to say, oh, thank you. Now I need to read a file. Just that's it. You take out the CPU, you assign it to another process and then start reading the file. And that's going to take a lot of time. We saw it already. You have four days now to, to read that piece of the file for the process. So different processes, given their nature, if they are IO bound or CPU bound, the operating system is going to treat them differently. It's going to give them more priority or not. And, and what might be counterintuitive, usually IO bound, IO heavy processes should get more priority in their CPU allocation. Again, this is going to be important later. Um, so how are we going to make our code concurrent or even parallel ideally we were talking about multiple processes so i could tell you you know you have a problem you need to process a large file it has i don't know a billion rows and you need to process that you when you process that you write your code and it says four lining lines blah 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 so you'd realize that it's sequential it's very slow and you know you should make that program concurrent. I could give you an answer right now. Just write your program so you, it can receive a parameter right here um, and just create multiple processes, instantiate multiple processes at the same time. Process file from, one, from line zero to 100 million. Uh, I don't know, run program from 100 million to 200 million rows. So you instantiate 10 times the same process with different pieces and you're done, right? That's that's a good answer. It's, it's going to get the job done. Of course, that you want to run everything concurrently in your program. You want to create one program that can spread its work across multiple threads or processes. That's what we want to do. So the first part of, we could say, intra-program uh, concurrency is gonna be working with threats. And that's what we're gonna talk about um, right now. Um, the objective, again, is gonna make, is gonna, is gonna be turning a sequential code into a potentially parallel code. So let's see an example. Let's say we have to pull data from three different websites. 
It's a slow website and it takes two seconds for each one of those requests. In a traditional code, these are traditional code, we make everything sequential. It's gonna take two seconds to get the first website, it's two seconds, two more seconds to get the second one, two more seconds to get the third one. In total, it's gonna be at least six seconds. If it can be even more if you have to combine it. Um, at least six seconds to process this sequential program. And this is a visual representation. First website, second website, third website, and at the end, the processing. So um, you can't, the key part here is that you're not, you don't start fetching the second website until you haven't finished the first website. This is the idea of multi-threading. It's gonna be instantiating or, or start everything at once, right? So everything can hopefully run in parallel and then reach a common point to synchronize everything back. This is the idea of multi-threading. So if we can do that, if we can spin multiple threads and they all run concurrently or in parallel, we're gonna first wait for all of them to finish. It's gonna be around two seconds and then we can do the combination at the end. Our code, how it's gonna look like. It, ideal, it's gonna look something like this. It's not the reality, it's just pseudocode. Um, but we're gonna see the, the abstraction of a thread to understand it a little bit better. The threading module is what we're gonna be using. And I'm gonna just give you a very quick introduction first. We're gonna be saying uh, some code. It's in a Jupyter notebook. We're gonna do a very simple introduction and then we're gonna dig into the more important parts, thread synchronization and all that. What I want you to remember is we are working in an intra-programming setup, right? We're creating our own code, our program is gonna be using multiple threads and we're gonna make that uh, hopefully concurrent. So let's just jump directly into our uh, code and let's start working with threads. It's finally time to see some actual Python code. We've done the whole conceptual introduction to about computer architectures, operating systems, uh, processes, threads conceptually, but now it's time to talk about real code, creating threads, get them to run, etc. So a couple of important notes here. We are gonna be using the thread class. This is our major, uh, the, the major class we're gonna be using throughout these first couple of lessons in which we're gonna create threads, we're gonna instantiate them, and we're gonna start them, we're gonna get them running, and we're gonna analyze them, check, check out their status, etc. But everything is gonna happen in this thread class. And this thread class is contained in the threading module. So this is a very important thing because we also have a underscore thread module in Python 3, but this is a very low level module that you should not be using. We don't use it. I haven't never used it. The threading module is the one that is using underneath the underscore thread and it's providing us with a much high level interface, right, for, for us to create uh, and manipulate threads. So the thread class, again, this is a major class, most important one we're gonna be using to create and start the threads. When you create it, you're gonna pass a target. This target is the function that it's gonna be run in a separate thread, right? So um, the, the remember that when you have your main process, have your main process, you're gonna be creating uh, a, a separate thread that is gonna run by its own, this th thread needs some sort of callable, it needs some action to perform. So we're gonna say which action we want it to do or to run based on this target. So we're gonna uh, first instantiate the thread that's gonna basically create these, the, the, the container of the thread, let's say this is the thread, and we're gonna be passing the target. So in this case, we're gonna be saying target equals simple worker. So it knows, right, that it has to run the function simple worker. Let's say the function simple worker, the code of simple, of simple worker is defined here. And then we're gonna start the thread. The moment we start the thread, it's when actually the thread is starting and it's performing its job. It depends what your function is about, the target function, what it's doing, and that, it's gonna say if the thread finish, finishes automatic, uh, not automatically finish at some point or it runs forever. It's very common to have threads that have a while true here. 
So basically, we want to have a background, a background worker that is checking on some status as long as our, our application is alive. In that case, you might see here while true. We're going to keep running this thread forever. It's going to be in the background. It's going to be do some computation, some checking in the background. But again, the important part here is we have our whole process. This is our Python process. And we're going to create a few threads. Let's say, assume with me, we're creating several of the threads, instantiating them, just creating instance t1, t2, t3 equals thread and a target. And we're going to pass the target, right, that it's going to point to a function, in this case, simple worker, right, that's the target. The thread is there, it's stale, it, has n it hasn't start started running. It's going to start running when we actually invoke the start method. In that moment, the, the thread is going to start its performance. So let's actually do the code here. I'm going to uh, define the simple worker function. I'm going to instantiate the thread. Remember, nothing is happening. Uh, what you can expect here, what's going to happen is that when we start the thread, when we actually start a thread, we're going to see a hello printed out. It's going to slip for two seconds and we're going to see a hello printed out. So I'm going to start the thread. We see the hello. We're going to wait and now you see the world. But the important part here is that I can I still have full control while this thread is running. So let me put this thing to, for example, five seconds. I'm going to redefine the function. I'm going to instantiate the thread. I'm going to do here a simple computation, two plus two. And I'm going to start the thread. And I'm going to, I can keep working on my computations that the thread is running in the background. In, and in this case, it, it's slipping, right? But at some point, there you go it return back, it run that final um, function that it had. And that in, this, in this particular moment, the thread is dead. We say we're going to see about the yeah, is alive method. The thread died, right? It just completed its work and it's now stopped. So um, a, a usual common thing to do is to create several threads all together. So in this case, we have all these threads here. I'm going to put a, a semicolon here so we don't see any output. And I start all the threads and the threads start um, slipping for some time or actually generating some random values, slipping for that time and working again. Everything is happening on the background. I still have full control in the main thread to do whatever I want. So let's do that again. I can keep running this thing and the thread is outputting uh, the result. So let's talk in more detail about thread states. As I told you, when we create the thread, it's there, it's stale, we could say. Is it alive? No, it's not alive yet. It's there, ready, but it's not alive. The moment that I start the thread, now the thread is alive, and you're going to see the alive uh, method is true. Something important is that, remember, we when we start the thread, the main thread, when we start the worker thread, to put it away, the main thread still has full control. What happens if you want to pause and wait for the thread to start, to stop, or to finish, so actually? Let's say um, you have this process, right, and, and you're aggregating data or whatever, and you started all these threads, right, they are all working with data, but you need to stop and pause until all of them finish. And one, once all of them are finished, now you can process the data. In that case, you do want the main thread to block. You do want the main thread to wait until that given thread or several threads, they all finish. And to do that, we have the join method. So I'm gonna instantiate the same thread again. I'm gonna start it. I'm gonna jump directly join. And as you can see here, the, my main thread now is paused. It has just stopped. We are waiting for the, for the thread we started to finish. The join method, again, is what's going to uh, pause the main thread and wait until that thread or that given set of threads, um, they all have finished. Once the thread has finished, multiple methods will raise a runtime error. In this case, the thread has already been stopped or it has actually finished already, so it can't be started again. You have to create a new instance of the thread if you want to start the same task again. Um, let's talk about thread identity, and this can be very helpful for debugging to understand better your code or to organize your code in a better way. 
Um, thread identity means that we can set a name for our thread, right? We can, in this case, the the, th the name is set automatically. But if I show you again the constructor of name of the thread, you're gonna see that names equals in this case by default is none. So the thread class, the threading module is gonna give it a random name, not random, but a sequential name, thread something. And each thread will be assigned a unique identifier, a unique ID, we are gonna say just ident in, in, ident in this case. So I'm gonna say, um, in this case, the ident parameter or attribute is none, but once I start the thread, we're gonna see that now it has been set up to a given value now that the thread has started at that point it has this id uh, which is just numeric for us to identify that particular thread no two threads are going to have the same id right that's an important thing we can set up our own custom name when we're starting the thread and we can um, actually consult that information from the main thread we can check what's the thread's name in that particular case or id Something interesting is that we can also check these values from within the thread. So here is an important conceptual thing. And let me go back again to our drawing board. If I have, this is my, remember the outside box is my process, Python process. The inside box is the Python thread, which is gonna run a given function, simple worker in this case. We can create several of these threads, right? So I'm gonna define all these threads. Let's say we have three threads and they are all pointing, they're all gonna be executing the same function, right? The way we define a function is by just, by defining the function is gonna be running in the thread is by just defining a simple function, right? I'm not saying anything crazy here, it's just basics, right? It's just a regular Python function. But what I wanna say here is that we're not making this function prepare to know which thread it's gonna be running. The same function has to be defined in a way that it's useful for all the threads we create. One, two, three, a thousand threads, they can all run the same Python code in the form of that function. So, what I mean by this is that the function, if we need to use the name of the thread and if we need to use the ID of the thread, we have to make it generic enough that each thread running here, potentially in parallel, right? Or concurrently, to be more precise. Th they are all executing the same code, but they're all gonna have different IDs. And that is what we're gonna achieve with these two very useful functions, uh, current thread and thread and get ident, which are generic dynamic methods that are gonna give you the the particular, um, let me stop this thing, that are gonna give you the particular um, value of the thread itself. In this case, it's gonna give you the whole thread, current thread, the function current thread, it's gonna give you the, the whole thread by itself in which you can then ask for the name, as we're doing here, t.name, and you also can get the identity, the ID that was generated. And in that case, just uh, get ident. It's gonna be the number we have. So let's actually use the same code to create three different threads, three different threads, each one with a custom name we're providing. And we're gonna start all of them. And now we are waiting for them to finish. So Bubbles, Blossom, Buttercup, they all finished. And when they started, they had internally each one of them they had their own ids so so far we've worked with very simple functions they are not receiving any parameters we're just starting there and they are running and this is not of course uh, realistic usually a function receives parameters it's very simple to pass parameters to the thread class to pass arguments we could say it's a little bit more difficult to work with dynamic situations like for example keyword arguments or um, yeah, different type of parameters we need to create dynamically based on the use case. And that's why one of the reasons that I have created the parallel library, but we're gonna talk more about that later. For now, I'm gonna show you, show you how simple it is to pass a few arguments 
to a given function. In this case, we have defined the simple workout function again, which receives now a time to slip. So far, we've always defined, in this case, randomly how much the function was slipping. In this case, we're gonna pass that value as a parameter. The way we're gonna do that is, as usual, we create an instance of the thread class, we pass a target, we pass the name of the, of the thread, and we're gonna pass a set of arguments. And in this arguments class, args, uh, so, sorry, not class, parameter, we're gonna pass all the values that are gonna serve as arguments for the function. In this case, it has to be a tuple. And as we have only, we receive only one parameter, I have to put this comma right here, so I don't want you to get confused about that. But here's basically a list of all the different parameters you wanna pass to your function. So in this case, I am running again, and you know here, for example, uh, bubbles right here is slipping for three seconds. Blossom here, here is slipping for 1.5 seconds. A different alternative way of creating and instantiating a thread and running it, etc., is not by providing a target function by itself, but creating a subclass of thread and defining the behavior of the thread in the run method. So this is also very common, and if you have a good architecture, a good design based on object-oriented programming in your code, this could potentially organize your code a little bit better. For example, if you have this background thread we have talking about, um, instead of defining a function separately in a different module and the thread in a different module, you can just put the thread, you can give it a, a very um, uh, obvious name, what's the purpose of the thread, and get it to run uh, without defining any external functions. Usually the function that we use for a thread, usually I'm gonna say like 80% of the time, it's a very particular function that is not used anywhere else. So it doesn't make sense to define the function in a global scope if it's gonna be just used by a thread. That's why again, you can define the same functionality within the run uh, method. The run method receives nothing, just self, the only parameter. We usually pass all the parameters in the constructor of the um, of the class, right? The initialization method of the class. And you, here you have to be careful of not to step over the parameters of threads. So uh, you can usually, if you're passing um, variable number of arguments, etc., cetera, have to pass it all here. The good news about defining your own class is that you can do pretty much whatever you want in the init method. And that means that any shortcomings that you have with arguments, right, can be fixed if you want with a custom class. Particularly, I prefer to create subclasses because again, it organizes my code better. I prefer to have this thread that has this particular functionality and everything is encapsulated in the run method. During this tutorial, and I have to be completely honest with you, I am not gonna be doing subclasses, but I will use a lot more the target one because it's easier to see the function defined separately. So just for the clarity of this tutorial, I'm not gonna be using subclasses so often, but let's see how it works. I'm just gonna instantiate the class. There you go, T now is an instance of my thread, and I have passed an, an only parameter, the, the number, the time to slip. I'm defining or I'm setting that parameter as, um, as an instance attribute, and now in the run method, I can use that parameter, right, in the run method. So I do t.start, t.start is running the run method, and here I can access all the attributes that I need. The name attribute, for example, it's interesting, remember that the name attribute is set even before the thread starts, so I can just use it directly. Not the same as with the uh, identity, the, the ID of the thread, which needs to be consulted in kind of a r real time, I don't know, in a, in a live dynamic manner. So let's talk about something very, very important conceptually, and it's the, this property, we have discussed it a little bit already, about threads using or having, the, having access to shared data, all right? So using our, our previous uh, conceptual analysis picture of uh, processes and threads, we said this is our whole process, the, the yellow box, 
and it has some code to run and it has defined a few local variables. Again, this is the whole process. The whole process will then instantiate a few threads and those threads will start. In that moment, all the threads within a process have access to every defined variables in that given process by itself. So in this case, we have time to slip was defined outside of the function and it's of course defining the main process. When I create my threads, and I'm gonna start only the first one so you can check so you can see it, you see that here is slipping for two seconds because it's what we have just defined. So let's re-instantiate them and run them all again and you see that all of them, all our threads are running by two seconds. Let's change this thing. I'm gonna put three seconds, 1.5 shorter and we define and start all of them and you see that they are all starting by 1.5 seconds this is interesting but you because you can change the behavior of your threads by altering the state of a global variable so let's say we have an exit exit um, underscore threads equals false right so here inside, we could do something like while not exit threads, we're gonna keep doing a background process, right? Just run. When we want all the threads to stop, we can signal that by changing this variable. In the main process, you'd say, you say uh, exit threads equals true, and now the next time this thing runs, it's gonna find that variable changed. We can modify the state or the work of a thread by modifying these global variables. That's an important thing. Um, this actually will introduce, of course, the problem of race conditions and stepping over shared data. We're gonna talk about, my, about that in our following lesson. So this was a very quick introduction to how Python threads work. I don't want you to memorize everything. Um, we're gonna be doing a lot of work, so it's gonna be very familiar by the end of this tutorial how threads work, how to create them, how to instantiate them, how to start them, etc. So I wanna finish this part, just the, our, our first approach to threads, with a real example of our threads and the way they run and all that. To do that, we're gonna be using uh, um, web server that I have included in this repository that is basically gonna give us um, prices of Bitcoin. So I'm gonna be instantiated here. I'm gonna, if you check the structure of your repo, you're gonna see crypto examples right here. And this is a Flask application that I can show you real quickly. It's uh, crypto examples, it's Flashhack, this one right here. And what this application is gonna be doing is returning prices from different uh, cryptocurrencies and exchanges and all that. The reality is that we could have consulted a real service by doing this tutorial, but the, to be honest, I don't wanna hit an external service by doing our tutorial because potentially you can be loading, overloading a server just for the sake of the education. So I took the time to recreate the application for only for this tutorial. So let's start uh, the, um, the app and we're gonna put, we're gonna put slip, no, no slip, there you go. And it's running in this URL, there you go. And it's a very simple app. And what we're gonna have is all the exchanges that are part of our app, they are all here, all the symbols or all the currencies we support, and then we can consult prices of the given dates. Let's see if there is a price here, I don't know. There is a price here, so for Bitfinex, um, BDC, this is the price of that given uh, date. Um, the way I have created this simple app, aside from the code, is by getting information from, um, where is, I think it's right here in this notebook, from CryptoWatch API. You can follow all these notebooks if you want to see the process that I follow to create the app, but basically I downloaded the information from this public API and I downloaded them all in CSV files and then I instantiated a SQLite database 
So the Flask app is reading the price from the database. So that method price is actually performing this query. You are gonna get the price for a given exchange, a given symbol, and a given date. We perform that query and we return the results if any. If there are no results, we will just return none. Um, so that's, again, a, a quick introduction of how our app works. So it's running, we can sit, we can sit right here. And what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna instantiate by base URL. We're gonna use the requests uh, module that it's used to perform HTTP requests. I, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. And we're gonna perform a simple query here to see what's the price. Actually, let's, let's follow the same price here. So we're gonna see Bitfinex, uh, BDC, but we're gonna change the date and we're gonna get the same price potentially. Oh, uh, let's see, close 7247, uh, close 7247.5. So it's the same price, price, sorry, again, for both of them. So now, why are we using this app? We're gonna be using it throughout the, the entire tutorial. What, I, what we wanna do here is we wanna check um, prices of uh, a few different cryptocurrencies on a few different exchanges. But to make things more interesting, what I'm gonna do is gonna restart the server by providing a sleep parameter. And this is an artificial time for the server to sleep. So we ch check right here, if sleep, we're gonna sleep each after each request is gonna be delayed for this given number of seconds. And this, which is in form right here, will help us simulate the process of a slow server. And that's why we need threats. If, we, if you remember from our conceptual explanation, we said, let's say we wanna consult three prices. We wanna consult, what do we have here? We're gonna check always for BDC, and we have Bitfinex, BF, we have Bitstamp, uh, Stamp, and we have Kraken these three exchanges. If each request is delayed by two seconds, right, two seconds, because we have artificially slowed down the server, if we make this sequentially, in that means no threats at all, just as you know it, you're gonna, you can do a for loop, you can do a list comprehension, whatever, the total time that it's gonna take you to run all these things is gonna be six seconds, or at least six seconds, around six seconds, right? Because you're gonna make this request, sleep for two seconds, slip, make this request, sleep for two seconds, make this request, slip for two seconds, and finally, the uh, process is gonna be done. If we run all these tasks of getting the price concurrently, that means, and, 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 and kind of, in parallel, right? I'm using these two inter interchangeably until we see the concept of the gill and all that. But if we run all these concurrently and we say these are all running, hopefully, let's say they're all running in parallel, that means that the whole process is gonna be finished in about two seconds. And that's the idea of using threads. Um, so let's, let's try it out now. I'm gonna uh, instantiate the threats, the exchanges we're gonna use, we're gonna use these three exchanges, and we're gonna measure how much time it takes us to do the whole request. So for each one of the exchanges, we're gonna be, this is the sequential, the sequential process, by the way. We first ask for Bitfinex, then for Bitstamp, and then for Cracking. This is taking us, say, 6.84 seconds. Right, this is sequential. We check a price first. We sleep. It just you know blocks. We then check the other one. Then check the other one. This is a sequential one that takes six seconds. But now let's do it concurrently. We're gonna define a function which is check price that receives uh, exchange symbol date and a base URL. We we're gonna use from the default one. And it's just gonna check that price. So now I can start one thread per each exchange that I have uh, set. So I have three exchanges, they're gonna be creating three threads. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start the time, start the threads, start counting, and now we see that all the prices, Bitfinex, Kraken, and Bitstamp, 
they have all finished in about 2.35 seconds. And this is what we are expecting from threads. We're expecting sequen uh, not sequential, sorry, concurrent, close to parallel execution to speed things up. Now, a few things here. We can't, we can't be sure which one is finishing first, to be honest. In this case, Kraken finished first. If we run this thing, uh, maybe another one can finish first. Um, not everything is so linear in, in the work you have to do in real life. In this case, we're artificially sleeping for two seconds. In real life, this request may be, I don't know, slower than this request, so you don't know how it's gonna end up. Um, and you also see that in this case, these two things were written in the same line. That's because there is some, there are some issues, right? Some shared uh, state uh, or side effects that are affecting that. We're gonna see more about that in our next uh, lesson. But again, the idea here is that we're speeding things up by uh, concurrently running the three threads to console the prices of those three exchanges. So this is wonderful, right? Let's say we have, let's say, let's follow this example and say, we want to get, um, we want to get prices for all the 10 ex exchanges we have in our system, the three symbols, BTC, LTC, Ether, Ether, and we want to get all the past 30 days. In total, we're going to be making 900 requests. Can we start 900 threads following this pattern, creating one thread per work? Can we create all those 900 threads? The answer is usually no, we cannot, because threads will, if we go back again to this picture, they will consume resources in the process. So we don't want to clog the entire process with a ton of threads working concurrently. So we're going to see how we can fix this with multiple ways. Mainly, we're going to use the producer consumer model. We're going to follow this example, exact example in which we will create a, a pool of threads, let's say 10, and they're going to take care of running all the requests. But again, what I'm saying here is uh, be careful, right? The summary of this is be careful how many threads you're going to create. It depends a lot on the system you're using. And we're going to talk more about that. There's a, a formula that the Python module uses uh, to calculate how many threads is optimal. Uh, but that is it. Finally, as a summary, remember, threading is the module we're using. Do not use threads, underscore thread, sorry, because it's a very low level module. You don't want to get messed up in there. So let's move forward with uh, thread data and red and race conditions. Let's talk now about th what are the implications of having shared data in our threads. In our previous in our previous notebook, we saw how multiple threads can access given local variables or actually global variables in a process, right? They're actually local to the main thread. It's, it's the, the notation is um, confusing, but basically threads can access shared data. Um, this is interesting because we saw we could control uh, the behavior of threads by just alt, um, by mutating different variables that are set in the global scope of the process. That can be convenient, uh, but it will also introduce a few problems. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, right now. The first problem we're going to see is the issue with uh, race conditions in which Conceptually speaking, and this is very conceptual, uh, race condition is going to be, and I have here linked to the uh, Wikipedia article, but basically a race condition is a problematic condition, something we don't want to have in a program in which the outcome of the program will depend on the way that or the order that some instructions are executed. And that's something we don't want. Let's say uh, today our program outputs five because I don't know, thread one run runs uh, before runs uh, thread two and tomorrow it outputs seven because thread two run first and, re and thread one run later. So we don't want to have just sort of random behavior in our programs because one thread bit the other and run first, right? We want a deterministic approach. We want things we are sure about. We we don't want our program to run successfully today because thread one won in the race com competition and tomorrow it fails transferring money incorrectly or, I don't know, granting access to a user that hasn't paid 
because another thread run first, right? We want our programs to be deterministic. So um, I'm gonna show you the problem of race conditions with this example. We have a global counter variable that it's set to zero, and we're gonna define this function increment in which we're gonna run in threads. We're gonna create 10 different threads, and we're gonna make them run a given number of iterations we're gonna pass. We're gonna say each thread to run a thousand times. So, right, we're gonna create, just to follow, we have, we're gonna create, we have a global counter variable starting in zero, and we're gonna instantiate 10 different threads, 10 here, I'm gonna do 10 different threads, right there. These are 10 threads. And each thread is gonna run 1000 iterations here of this code. 1000, we're passing that as a parameter, but in this case, we have defined 1000. 1000 repetitions of that given iteration, incrementing the counter by one. Right, so they're all incrementing the share counter by one. Right, that's what they are all doing. Um, what could be the expected output of this? Let's say, forget about threads for a second. Let's say you run this thing sequentially. You run first the first thread here. You run a thousand, um, a thousand iterations. So the output is gonna be 1000, or sorry, not the output, the value of counter after these first thread runs is 1000. Then you run the second thread and this one increments all of the counter by 10, by 1000 again, sorry. So in this case you have 2000 here and then this finishes and we have another thread, a thousand iterations, now it's 3000, right? So the output at the end of this thing is gonna be equals to the number of threads we have, we're gonna say number of threads times the number of iterations. In our example, we have 10 threads, 10 times a thousand iterations. So our result is gonna be 10,000. That's gonna be the result, the final result that we are expecting in a correctly executed, but slow, it doesn't matter, but correctly executed program. We're gonna have 10,000 is gonna be the output. What we're gonna see in the wrong behavior, in the problematic race condition behavior, is that these threads will be stepping into onto each other and they will be mutating data here and there and the output will be different than 10,000. That's of course problematic. We don't want that to happen. So let me uh, clear up all this thing and we're gonna run the example. We're gonna define the increment function, the iterations um, variable we're gonna instantiate the threads and we're gonna start them all to run. They all, all finished, this was very fast, we're slipping them for just a few milliseconds. And now, well, it all worked. Now, sorry, the threads fail. So this is interesting. In the first example, not something that usually doesn't happen and I was actually thinking about trying to replicate it. In the first example, it worked, you know, and that's the problem with race conditions and this is a great thing that happened. You might run your code and it might run correctly, like the first example, it worked, but then you try it in production and it breaks. It, it, the worst thing is, is that it doesn't break. In this case, I am making it break on purpose. The problem is that you have an, uh, an incorrect result, which if you're confident about the code because you run it locally and it worked or the tests are passing, in production, you will, you will trust this value of counter. Although, again, it's a faulty one. So let's do it again. Let's try creating the threads and see how they work. Well, it seems like it keeps failing now. And, and check the results, the counter variable, it's always different. It's like completely random, it's just whatever, 32,000. And in this case, it's uh, 47,000. It's just, oh, I'm not changing the counter. There you go. So uh, uh, I thought 1,760. Um, 60, 660, yes. So again, another value and resetting the counter and it always changes 
the value. It's completely random. It's completely random. You don't know what the value it's going to be, right? This is the, uh, the result of a race condition. And why does this thing happen? Well, it happens because if you look into the details of this operation, counter plus equals one, what you're gonna see is that internally, there is no way of performing this operation in just one step. In reality, what we do, if we have a value z, the c, sorry, that is zero, and we wanna increment c, what we do is we um, create an auxiliary variable with the value or the, the code equals c plus one, so that is now one, and then we set the value here. We do c is equals to aux. That's the usual process that computers are gonna follow. So that again, that's like two, three operations at least. Define aux, create this sum, give this result, and then uh, set it back again to c. In this moment, if you have um, if you have parts of these being run by different threads, they might be stepping onto each other's data. Let's say we have counter equals zero. This is a whole the whole counter, and we have these two threads that are starting uh, concurrently. Three. This is T one. And they start with this operation, create aux and counter. That's gonna be the same for them. Aux is gonna be equals to C plus one for them. For both of them, it's gonna be the same, equals C plus one for, the, for both of them. But these two run at the same moment, exactly the same moment in parallel. That means that C for T1 is gonna be zero, so it's gonna be zero plus one, but it's also gonna be here, zero for, num for three thread, sorry, number two. So in this moment, the result of A is gonna be equals for, we're gonna be the same for both of them. It's gonna be one here, it's gonna be one here. Then it doesn't matter which one wins, setting back the value here, but basically we run two operations and they both got the same value, right? At the end, there's gonna be just one. What we want here, I'm gonna clear this thing up, we want C, what we want is that these two threads, if when A reads the value C, zero plus one, we want the first thread, which is C plus one, we want it to wait until a equals one until this one puts the value here and now this can go and read it. We want the threads to be isolated and we don't want them to collide at the moment of reading or writing data. And we are gonna achieve that with what we call thread synchronization. This is a very big deal in computing it's a very big deal. It's gonna happen in operating systems, database systems. If you wanna read more about it, there are tons of uh, books written about them. About it, uh, you can get any operating system textbook, and it's gonna talk about. There's gonna be a chapter about synchronization. I guarantee it. So it's a very big deal in computing, and. The way synchronization works, basically, but in a very conceptual manner, is by signaling states. Signaling that I am, in this moment, I am accessing to counter, so please stay away. Uh, by signaling that I have just finished updating counter, so now you can read it, etc. Just by creating signals and um, informing the, that someone is currently using something and that something, that shared resource, is currently busy. It's it's already being used. And a very good example is this, this recording light. This is from our own studios, in reality. I took this photo. In which, as a human, if I want to use the studio record, the, the recording studio, which is a shared resource, there are several instructors and we all use the same uh, recording studio. If I want to use it, the shared resource, and I approach and I reach the door and I see that the light has been turned on, 
I will not use the resource. I will not use the recording studio because that means that someone else is using the studio. I will work. I will wait, sorry, for the light to go off and then I will step into the studio because I know that someone has just finished using that resource and now I can get in. Potentially, there are going to be multiple instructors waiting outside. And, and the question is, which one is going to reach the studio and turn the light on um, first, right? That's all another issue with synchronization. So conceptually speaking, synchronization is protecting shared resources by providing these signals, by providing these, cue, these, um, these hints, right? Saying someone has already used these uh, resources. And the big deal about it is that synchronization is usually cooperative. Um, it's not that the light has a physical power that it's stopping me from getting into the studio. If I'm a, a bad instructor, if I'm a bad thread, I can open the door anyways and interrupt the instructor in the middle of, the, of his or her recording session, right? And that's catastrophic. They're going to be losing two hours of, of recording because I stepped into it in the middle of it. For example, if they're in a, web, in a live webinar, I'm completely destroying their work. But... I'm, I'm, I'm st uh, stopping and waiting outside because I am a co cooperative uh, instructor, right? I, I decide to stay outside, but nothing is stopping me from actually walking in. And the same thing is going to happen with our threats. Our threats will use synchronization methods, but they are all cooperative. That's co uh, cooperative. That's because we have decided to write the code in that way in the best of our intentions we're writing the code to use synchronization but if you have a malicious piece of code or a sloppy programmer someone forgot to use that synchronization mechanism then nothing will prevent the shared data to be corrupted so let's talk now in particulars we're gonna see our first synchronization mechanism which is a lock. It's a very simple, it's probably one of the oldest uh, sort of um, synchronization primitives that we use. And there are multiple uh, synchronization mechanisms like locks, uh, semaphores, there are multiple ones. And in this case, we're gonna be using a uh, lock. Again, it's one of the simplest one. It's usually a mutual exclusion lock. It's also called mutex, it has several names. Basically, a lock works as a real lock. You know, there is this shared resource and there is an open, we're gonna, I'm gonna try drawing a lock. It's an open lock. Someone uses the resource, so they just sh shut down, they close the lock. When they are, when they are uh, ready, or when, when they're finished using the lock, they're gonna open the lock and now it's gonna be available for someone else to go and take it, for someone else to go and use it. <laughs> So the way it works is by we create one instance of the lock. The lock will be shared. We're all using the same lock. And the thread that is going to work on that lock will try first acquiring the lock. This is basically, uh, I want to use this resource, these resources, what we're doing right here in between. So when I use this resource, I'm going to acquire the lock. So now I owned this lock. So nobody else by using, by doing this, I will be guaranteed that nobody else, no other thread will be able to acquire the lock. So the operation acquire on a lock is atomic. If I get a true output out of this, that means that I am the sole owner of the lock. Um, then I can do pr and, and work with any, I, I can do whatever I want. Usually, once you acquire the lock, you're gonna perform some operations on that shared resource you have. So let's say it's the counter variable. The moment to increase the value of counter is in that particular moment when you have acquired the lock. Any work that is not potentially, um, it's not gonna suffer from a race condition, potentially, is gonna stay out of the lock because the lock operation can potentially slow you down. If the resource is busy, you will not be able to acquire the lock and you will not be able to do that work. So usually anything that is not um, dealing with shared data is gonna stay outside of the lock. Once you acquire the lock, again, you do whatever you want, 
Hopefully it's just gonna be related to share data, share resources. And then once you're done, you release the lock. You say, I am done. Whoever wants to do this work now, they can acquire the lock again. So let's see how that works. Um, I acquired the lock, I did something, and then uh, the lock finished. Um, there you go, sorry, the lock finished. Uh, the I slept for 10 seconds, so that means that I'm gonna be sharing or sorry, um, I will I will have the lock acquired in this thread. I will keep it busy for 10 seconds and then I am releasing it. So what happens if I try to acquire the lock while this thread has lock acquired? Well, it's gonna block. So let me show you that. T dot starts um, started acquiring the lock. The lock is acquired. Is the lock locked? Yes, it's locked. What happens if I try acquiring it? I'm gonna run the code again. I'm gonna increase the time here so you can see very clearly what's gonna happen. I'm gonna start the thread again, it's locked, and now I will try acquiring it. And as you can see, the process is has just stopped. It's waiting to acquire the lock. The acquire operation is gonna block until the the thread, whoever, whatever thread, actually successfully acquires the lock, okay? Now, the main thread has a lock, and, and we can use a, a drawing to simplify this. So we have this thread, we have, uh, let's put a share lock right here, and we're gonna have, this is open, let's say this is open, and what happened here was that in this line, start, the thread acquired the lock, right? So in this case, is this one is, the, let's put T as uh, the, the owner of the lock. So when the main thread or main code in the process tries to access the lock again here, it tries to lock and it's locked. So it's just waiting, there it's waiting. It's waiting until the lock is released. Once the there you go, I'm gonna clean this up. Oh. Once the um, the thread here releases the lock, it's empty. Now the main thread can take ownership of that lock. So now the lock is owned by this main thread. But now I have this thread finished, it's done. I have created a new thread here, I'm gonna put it here. Again, this is done. When it, if I run it again and it goes here in this line and tries to acquire the lock, that thread is gonna block forever, at least until I release it. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna start the thread. It has, it's trying to acquire the lock. It's slept there, right? It's just stop there. This is blocking, the thread is waiting. And what I can do, right, the thread is waiting there, it's waiting, it's waiting, it's waiting, it's waiting. What I can do is from the main thread, I can say, well, now release the lock, just release it. And I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna release the lock. Immediately, the um, lock acquire said right here, lock acquire, and then uh, it finished slipping and all that because I didn't pass any time. But the idea is that the thread was stopped and waiting, it was blocked because I, I the main thread, had the locked uh, acquired. The moment I released it, that other thread was able to run it. So using all this, that might be confusing, uh, we're gonna use a real example and we're gonna fix our counter. Remember, after 1,000 operations, 10 different threads, we're waiting, we're, we're expecting to have 10,000 uh, out in the final result, in the final counter. So the way we're gonna do that is for it in each iteration before we modify this shared data, this important shared data, we're gonna acquire a lock. So at that moment, we know that nobody else will update that counter. We will have sole ownership of that counter. We're gonna update it and then we will immediately release the lock. So anybody else waiting to get and get the lock 
will be able to do it. So I will uh, initialize, uh, initialize counter, initialize the increment or define the increment. I define a lock. Remember that a lock is a shared resource too. We all have to use the same lock. If we are using different locks, it doesn't make any sense. And I'm gonna create all the threads and now I'm gonna start all the threads. And they're working. I'm gonna shine and wait until they finish. They all finish pretty quickly. And let's see the result of counter. Counter is 10,000 as expected. Let's do the whole thing again. 10,000. I can do this a thousand times and I can guarantee you now that this will work because no two threads will be modifying counter at the same moment. Now, let's go back again to the problems that we could potentially face with thread synchronization. The first one is the issue with, um, and we say that this was a cooperative task that we were running. I wrote this code and I was thoughtful enough to put a lock before accessing counter. But again, that will require that me understanding the problem, me being careful enough to include the, the, the lock or my coworker um, also being, um, you know, awake at the moment of code reviewing to let me see that I'm forgetting a lock, etc. So there are multiple things can go wrong. I have four listed problems right here. Um, the first thing is you might forget to use locks, you know, at all. Like if, if you are if you're just in a hurry and you're modifying some global variables, you might not realize that you might be stepping into a race condition. So not understanding race conditions correctly, not understanding shared data correctly, um, just might be an issue, you know, of lack of experience. When you're starting to write your write your first concurrent programs, you will lack that experience. So that's a problem by itself. The second problem is that uh, you might forget to acquire the, the lock. If I remove this line, and I haven't tried this, so I'll just go ahead and do it. Uh, if I remove this line, I will not execute the code. If I remove this line and and nobody actually acquires the lock, it's like, you know, having an open lock is like having no lock at all. So the problems will arise anyway. It's in this case, we are required to acquire the lock at the moment we uh, we need it. And on top of that, the lock is kind of a, a philosophical word we have in our in our code, but it's not protecting counter. Nothing is protecting counter. I could have uh, I could have modified counter before the lock. And you know they, they asked me, hey, did you use the lock? Yes, I I did use it, but nobody's saying where I used it. And this is a pretty dumb example. Sorry, it's just like five tech lines of code, but in a more complicated program in which you have a ton of shared data and multiple locks all scattered around, this is gonna be a problem. You might put the lock acquire in the wrong place or you might forget it to put it at all. Um, then it's the problem of your critical section, again, doing something that the lock is uh, protecting or not. And finally, what happens, this is a big deal, what happens if you forget to release a lock? If I forget to release the lock, all the other threads will be blocked forever. If I have a bug in my program and I'm not releasing the log, lock, sorry, all the other programs or threads, sorry, they will all be blocked forever. Um, let's actually see a problem with that. I'm gonna create a new lock and I'm gonna define this function um, right here. I'm gonna start it. And what is gonna happen here is that I'm gonna pause a faulty, I'm gonna say an error when in the slip parameter. So what is gonna happen here is that this code is gonna run, it's gonna acquire the lock. I have a release, so let's, let me, let's say I submit a pull request, you review this code, and you see the lock here release, and you see here the acquire, and everything makes sense, and you say, hey, the code, this code runs perfectly. But there is a problem. What happens if this slip parameter is invalid, as it's gonna be here? The moment that this code runs is going to raise an exception and the thread is going to be stopped altogether. 
So that means that we will never reach this section and I will never release the lock. So now let's run it. It blew up an exception. The lock was acquired. So now this lock is uh, still in this acquisition process, uh, state that nobody else can acquire. Just it's going to hang there forever. My code is now hanging forever. I'm going to interrupt this artificially. There is no way of doing this uh, in your code live. Uh, but again, this thing is locked. Can't do anything about it. So the way we can fix this is by passing a timeout in the acquisition process. So let's say I want to acquire the lock, but I say I'm only want to wait here for two seconds because if the log hasn't, hasn't been released in two seconds, that is potentially a problem. You can put whatever value you want here, or you can even go as, as, um, uh, to, to the point to say, I want to acquire the, block, the lock, I do not want to block. So now the result is false if the lock was not acquired, and true if you have successfully acquired the lock. So this will not block. We can release the lock and now all works. So this is a very common problem. You read the code, there is an, an acquire um, call and there is a release code call, but anything in between, anything in between before the release, if something fails, the lock will be acquired forever. It will be acquired forever because the exception will prevent this line to run. So that's a very common pattern in programming in general when accessing accessing databases, when accessing files, when accessing uh, networks, when accessing these uh, important costly resources. And there is a way in Python to um, overcome those difficulties with the usage of context managers, right? So the with statement is a context manager in Python. And what it's going to do is going to run basically this pattern right here. It will acquire the lock. It will try running this critical section. And if anything fails, it doesn't matter if it fails, it will always release the lock, regardless of the condition. If it works or if it doesn't, if it blows up because of an exception or if it doesn't blow up, it will always release the locks. That's the pattern that the with statement is following. So we're going to do that. I'm going to instantiate the lock. I'm going to start it. Uh, the lock was acquired. Lock was acquired. And now we're going to run the example with the problem, the, the one that blows up. The code blew up. So that means that at this moment it stopped. But as we're using the context manager, we will see that the code is not locked and we can acquire the lock immediately. Again, this is the pattern that we are using right here. So finally, to fix the code with the with statement with the context manager, the only thing we're doing is before our uh, increment encounter, we're just going to just use uh, lock with lock, we are ensuring that we will acquire the lock in this point, we do whatever we want to do. And then right here, the lock has been released. And this should all work as expected. There you go 10,000 everything is working. So even though we started our lesson using acquire and release, this is actually not recommended. The recommended way to acquire and release a lock is with the with statement. It's a lot shorter and you will never forget to release a lock. It's a lot simpler just to say with lock and use the context manager. As a summary of this lesson or this notebook, We've talked about shared data, we talked about race conditions and the problems with them, and we've also talked about threat synchronization. There are multiple mechanisms, there are multiple tools that have been built to uh, improve with, uh, the, the, to synchronize multiple threats. All these tools, they are manual tools to put in a wave, they're all cooperative, and there is no free lunch, we could say. There is uh, it's not that by using the tools, you will ensure forever that all your code will be correct. That's not the reality. And sadly, it can also go wrong, even if you use those synchronization mechanisms. And that's why 
To be honest, we will try to stay away from synchronization as much as possible. Once we reach this point right here, it's gonna make a little bit more sense. But first, we're gonna see another issue with thread synchronization, which is the big deal of uh, getting into a deadlock. As promised, we're gonna now talk about deadlocks and you should be scared because a pretty, pretty scary thing happening in real life and we should avoid it. We're gonna start first by um, by understanding when uh, deadlocks will happen. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna simulate another uh, race condition. So I'm gonna just run this thing right here. I'm gonna explain what happens. There are two accounts, each one of them with a thousand dollars. And we're gonna start two threads, which what, the, what they will do is move money around. They will take $10 out of this account and put it here. So now this one is gonna be uh, 990 and this is gonna be uh, 1,010. Uh, they, it's gonna take, I don't know, 500 out of this. It's gonna be 409, it's gonna be uh, uh, 1,510 in here. It's gonna move the uh, money around. There can't be money created. All the money we move from here, we place it here, and all the money money we put we move from here, we place it here. It's a way a regular transaction works. So the thread is starting with a from account and a to account, and um, we say move from A1 to A2 for the first thread, and we say move from A2 to A1 for the second thread. When they're moving money around, what happens is that at some point a raise condition arises and they find incorrect balances. I am not preventing uh, negative numbers, but again, uh, an incorrect balance happens. Basically, the total money in these accounts, they has to be 2000. So we're gonna take an approach to fix those um, those uh, that issue that race condition with locks. Basically, we're gonna create two locks, one for each account. So we're gonna say lock from and lock to from and to as the account. So a one to a two, and the lock for a one is gonna be uh, lock from, and the lock for a two is gonna be lock to. And the code in order to um, run the code, what it's gonna do is it's gonna first acquire the first lock, then acquire the second lock, and it's gonna move money around. It's gonna create the sum, check the sum, everything, and then it's gonna move forward. If at any moment it finds the um, incorrect behavior or condition of money being created, basically, it's gonna stop. We will find that potentially this will this will work to put it in a way, I'm gonna run it. And seems like there is no money created uh, until, right? We reach the uh, iteration limit, at least, right? We run for a, a million times and at least on that, at, until that moment, everything seemed to work. We can do a second test and see if everything works. It's waiting a, a million operations. There you go. It finished the the iteration and the sum is still two thousand dollars. There was there was no money created or 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 you know lost. The state is the same. Everything seems to be correct. If I check the locks, they're both unlocked. This again seems to be working, but there is a potential very dangerous situation that it's waiting for us. And I'm gonna show you that right now. The only thing that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna reset the accounts, is I am going to change the way the logs are passed. Log one, log two, I was passing before from and to, so I was using the same log for each account. I'm gonna change that, I'm gonna say log one, log two, log two, log one. And I'm gonna start those threads and we're gonna see that this will never end. I can sit here for a thousand hours and this will never end. I'm gonna interrupt this for now and I'm gonna check the balance of the accounts. Seems that they are still balanced, but both locks are locked. They're both acquired. 
the issue that we have just faced, and again, I can try running this again, it's gonna block forever. The issue that we have just faced is what we know as a dead lock, in which two resources are locking, right? Share resources, and no lock can move forward because the other locked has the resource that they need. And there is a, uh, when I was in regular software engineering school more than 10 years ago, in our operating system class, we were using this very popular uh, book. It's a very book, very good book about operating systems, very conceptual, very low level. You don't need to read it if you're not terrifically, ter terribly interested about it. Um, it had this quote that says, uh, perhaps the best illustration of a deadlock can be drawn from a law passed by Kansas legislator, legislator, sorry, my that word it's not good for me, early in the 20th century. It said, in part, when two trains approach each other at a crossing, both shall come to a full stop and neither shall start up again until the other has gone. So there are two threads approaching an intersection. They both have to go to a full stop and no train can move until the other has left. But if no thread can, if no train can move, that means they're gonna be sitting there, waiting there forever. Um, so this is a good explanation of what's happening right here in our code. The first thread acquires the first lock, it's good. Remember for a second, I'm gonna actually copy the, the code. I'm gonna paste it, do we have it again? Here. Uh, there. So remember what's happening. The first, when it tries to acquire the first lock, it succeeds, acquires the first lock. Thread two tries to acquire the second lock, it succeeds. But then thread one needs both locks in order to proceed. So when it goes to get the second lock, it was already owned by thread two. So it can't and it sits and waits. But when thread two goes to this place and to lock one and tries to acquire the first lock, it was firstly acquired by thread one. So it sits and waits. So they both have a shared resource and they're waiting for the other one and no thread can move because they both are blocking something that the other thread needs. So this is a very bad situation. It's very common in computer science to talk about deadlocks, also about excavation and a few others. We're gonna talk about deadlocks mainly. Um, the issue again with deadlock is when shared resources, they are um, acquired by one of the, by one thread in this case, and the other one needs it, but it, that other one that needs the, the lock is also waiting for some other piece, and it's a very common problem. The usual procedures to prevent locks or deadlocks, sorry, is ideally not to synchronize code at all. <laughs> We're gonna again see more about that here, but not to synchronize code at all. Um, and if you need to use uh, locks manually, never lock on something forever. Okay, so remember that your acquire method had a timeout never lock on something forever. Always give it a chance to clean up, roll everything back and start over. So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, thread one is gonna acquire the first lock, thread two is gonna acquire the second lock. Um, thread one is gonna try acquiring this lock. It's gonna just give it up, I don't know, one second chance. If at that time, one second, it hasn't been able to acquire the lock. It's gonna release this lock, it's gonna go back, release this lock, and start the whole thing again. That's not fast, to be honest, we're introducing a ton of uh, inefficiencies, but it's gonna prevent the deadlock. No thread will, set, will sit waiting forever on a lock if they see that after some time it hasn't progressed, if they haven't been able to acquire all the locks they need, they will just stop, roll everything back, release everything and move back again. So that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna define a very tiny timeout. We're gonna wait only for this amount of time. And what the code follows these, we're gonna do uh, the regular thing we did, we did before. We're gonna define this locked variable and that the thread 
will try to acquire both locks. So this one and this one, second one. And it fit with a given timeout. If they were able to, block, to lock everything, the value will be locked. In other case, if they were not able to lock everything, the, they will release the lock that was acquired and everything is going to start again because locked is going to be kept as false. So again, it will try acquire the, the lock. Let's say the first one was acquired correctly. So this is here, this is true. The second one was, it's going to wait, it's going to block for 0 point, 0 0.001 seconds. And then it returns false. It says it said I did I wasn't able to acquire this lock in this amount of time. So then, if were all the locks acquired? No, true and false. One of them was not acquired. So locked. So this is not the code. It gets in this branch. And is rest one acquired? Yes, it's acquired. So release it. Is rest two acquired? No. So there is no need of releasing it. And then. <clears throat> it um, goes back again to the beginning. Lock this falls and it keeps moving the process. So we're gonna try acquiring the lock kind of forever. We could potentially give it a, a number maximum of, of iterations, but in this case, we're gonna wait forever until we can uh, acquire the lock. And I'm gonna run this code. It's gonna take some time, but as you can see, we have reached the iteration limit. So that means that we never deadlocked and everything is working correctly. So again, the process is we need to acquire the locks with a given timeout. We should never block forever. Acquire the lock with a given timeout. And then if everything happened, we do whatever we need. We have now both locks. In other case, we're gonna move forward and try to do the same thing again and again and again until we actually lock the resources. Um, so what's the summary of these, let's say, first three lessons altogether is that, and this is a very funny image in, from a Mozilla developer, what we've just learned is that it's very hard to write correct uh, concurrent code using synchronization uh, techniques. It's very hard. There's always a bug in there. There's always a deadlock that can arise. There's always an, an unfortunate race condition that can arise. It's very, very hard to write um, synchronized, correctly synchronized code. Either deadlocks, starvation, race conditions, any of these things can arise. And it's very hard to debug the code and understand when you're doing something correctly on where, or when you are not, okay? So uh, that's kind of the, sum the summary of this whole lesson. You are watching this tutorial because you want to use um, multi-threaded code, probably concurrent code. I just wanna warn you that it's not gonna be simple to keep that correct. You have to do a thousand tests. Um, you have to make sure that to have a ton of eyes on top of that code, reviewing it correctly, because if you hit a deadlock in production, that's the worst thing that can happen. Your whole system will be blocked forever until you go and manually stop it. So something we don't want to do. Moving forward, we're going to see a more, a more um, real life approach to work with a multi-threaded code that is going to solve multiple of the issues we're going to, that we've faced in these first three lessons. We have pointed out two major issues when working with concurrent code, with working with multiple threads when writing multi-threaded programs. The first one was that if we had too many tasks to perform, right? Like in our example, we wanted, wanted to check for 900 prizes in our cryptocurrency prize server. Um, these were too many tasks to assign each one to a separate thread. We couldn't create 900 threads. That was the first issue we pointed out. The second one, it's of course the most complicated one to deal with, which is shared data and synchronization. We said that writing synchronized code is very hard. It's error prone. It's hard to debug. There is always an issue there. Deadlocks can happen. Corrupted data can happen. There are multiple things can go wrong when writing synchronized code. What we're going to see now 
is a partial solution to many of these problems, both handling a large number of tasks and also we will see a technique that will allow us not to synchronize code if possible. Um, and this is the producer consumer model in multi-threaded code. Producing consumer is a very generic denomination for multiple models. In this case, uh, applied to, to multi-threaded codes means that we're gonna have two main groups of threads. Um, once one group of threads, or usually just one thread, will be the, the ones producing work to do, creating tasks putting them in a work queue and then consumers threads, other threads, will pull from this queue in order to see what uh, tasks are pending to perform, right? So we have some producers, some uh, uh, threads that are creating the tasks that need to be done and workers that are pulling those tasks and actually performing the work. The important part here is that all this is synchronized in this queue, which is in Python it's thread safe. That means that we don't need to synchronize it because there will no there will be no memory corruption. There will be no uh, race conditions when putting objects or getting objects from this the queue. So what we're gonna do, and this is why we're solving these two issues, is first we can create a given number of consumer threads. We have 900 prices to check, so our queue will have 900 tasks. And then let's say we have 10 threads or 30 threads, whatever. Let's say we have 10 threads, then there will be 90 prices to check per thread. Uh, there will be always constantly 10 threads running and they will pull prices, work, do, do the work. And when, once they're finished, they're going to put another price and do the work. And that's going to keep in, uh, repeating until there is no more work. To do that is usually the process so we're, we've shared the issue with too many tasks and again as this collection the queue is thread safe we have also solved the issue of synchronization we will not need to manually synchronize our code so the queue that we're talking about is actually from the queue module it's a thread safe queue and it's a has a very simple API. We're gonna instantiate a queue. We can check if it's empty. We can put objects with a put method, and we can uh, check if it's empty again. It's not empty, of course. The size of the queue, and we can get objects out of the queue. A few important things. I don't know how familiar you are with um, uh, with data structures. In this case, uh, the queue is first in, first out. A, B, C is the way we put the objects. A, B, C is the way we got out the objects. You can create a, a last in, first out of Q2 if you want. It's usually call a stack, it depends. Um, I don't wanna get too deep into the data structures. The idea is that you're putting on one side, you're getting from the other side. And again, the, in this case, the order is respected. Um, an important thing is that as this is a thread safe queue, you might, there are a few things that are no, not synchronized to put in a way. They're not pr problematic, but for example, checking if a queue is empty or the size of the queue might be a stale result from time to time um, because there might be another object pulling from the queue, but that doesn't matter. Usually it's not a problem at all. But again, put, it's gonna put objects in the queue, tasks in our case, as we're gonna, it's gonna be a task queue for us and get is gonna get the object from the queue. The queue is now empty. Whenever you get an object, the object is removed. It's not that you're reading from the queue, you're actually getting the object out of the queue in order to process it. And that's good because that means that no two threads will see the same task. Once one thread gets the object, the other threads will never repeat the same task. Um, the get the, the important thing about the queue is that it's prepared to work in a threaded environment. In this case, the, the queue is empty. It's like brand new. If I try to get from the queue, the queue will block because it's waiting, right? The, the queue is, it's, this is a, a blocking operation in which we are practically saying, hey, I am ready to process a new task. Give me a task to process. And as the queue is empty, 
we will keep blocking until a producer thread on the other end puts an, uh, an object. And immediately after they put the object, this method will unblock and it will and we will receive the task to perform. So that's why the get method is made to be blocking. You have to be aware of that because you could potentially block forever. Um, to prevent that, if necessary, you can pass either block false or you can say timeout, right, a given time. And this is very similar to the lock acquire interface, right, in which uh, the, the acquire yeah, API of the method that we said that we could prevent blocking altogether or pass the timeout. The important part here is that if you don't get an object out, the method will raise an empty exception, a queue.empty exception. So we have to catch that. Um, a queue can also have a max size, right? So we can say how many resources we're going to create. And in this case, if you want to put another object, you have to wait for someone to consume the one that was created first. Okay, so you can always be sure that the maximum size of the queue will always be one. There will be no more than one uh, element in that given queue. And of course, these methods will also raise an exception, in this case, the full exception, queue.full exception. Um, the usual process then, and this is kind of a, 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 a protocol, an algorithm, is for the worker threads, they will try getting an object out of the queue. If the queue is empty, right, they will pretty much just break out of the code. We should, we should put here something like a return statement. If the work if a task was successfully pulled from the queue, that means that there is still work to do. So we get here, the worker does, uh, do, uh, yeah, performs the task and finally notifies the queue saying that that given task is now done. And this is an important property of the queue uh, object because this will let you also process failures. Let's say that you get the object um, and you can also put it back again if it hasn't been finished, for example, if, if there's an error, etc. So this, is, this works as a sort of counter. How many tasks have been put, how many have been processed, and then you can just get all of them uh, to a zero state, and that means that the queue, the work to do, is empty. So here, important part is, again, we will ask to get at a task, we will not lock, or we could include a timeout. But if this method raises an exception, that means again, that all the work is done because the queue has been empty. This is valid only for 90% of the cases. Sometimes you have producers creating tasks in the queue and consumers pulling tasks at the same time. With the model of waiting for the queue to get empty, that means that all the, all the work has been placed in the queue and now you're waiting to finish. Once the queue is empty, you can assume that there is no more work to do. But if producers are injecting elements in the queue constantly, both of them are producing and consuming, producing and consuming, that might not be the case. An empty queue might not mean that there is no more work to do, but maybe it means that producing producers are not producing tasks uh, um, fast enough. So the, the consumers have to block. And then you can either say here, uh, blocking equal true, which is the default, that means wait forever, or put a timeout. If there are no more job, uh, sorry, tasks created in, I don't know, 10 seconds, that means we can give up and we can just, you know, finish because there is no more work to do. So let's see with all this theory, let's see a real example. Uh, we're going to be pulling those uh, nodes. Oh, I have the server stopped. We're going to start. Uh, we will not make it slip. So it's fast enough. Um, you see it's working. 
And again, the objective is to get these 900 requests as we said in our first lesson, but we're gonna do it in this um, consumer, pr producer consumer model. So these are all our exchanges and we're gonna do it for all these dates. I have just randomly selected uh, 30 days, 31 days, 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 sorry, in March. Um, and we're gonna do it for all the symbols, BTC, Ether and LTC. And um, in total, we're gonna have 1,023 different requests. Remember, we'll have 31 days, not 30. Um, the method, the function we're working with, check price, is very simple. It re receives exchange, symbol, date, and a base URL. It's gonna build the request and return the response. That's everything that it's doing. So let's say we randomly select uh, uh, exchange, symbol, and a date. So in this case, we're gonna get Litecoin from Bitstamp on this date. And let's check the price and let's see what it gets. There we go. Uh, this is the output of this function. Some we don't have prices for all the exchanges in all the currencies in all the dates. So these might potentially be none. Just want you to be aware of that. So what we're gonna do now, very important, is we're gonna initialize a queue. We're gonna put all the tasks that we need our threads to complete. And again, in this case, or in, in this particular example, we're in this field or this category in which we know upfront all the work that we need so we can initialize that queue, we can put all the work in there just once, and there will be no producer threads, just aside from the main thread. It's not that pr producers are constantly putting tasks we can initialize the queue saying we want you to complete all this work, put everything in there, and the consumer threads will take care of that. So at that particular moment, we can say moment zero of time, I'm gonna introduce all, the, I'm gonna put all the objects in the task. Um, the tasks have this form, it's just a plain old dictionary, and we say we want you to get the price from Poloniex, uh, Litecoin on this particular date what it's, it's just a dictionary that represents a pending task, right? Task that put for all of them. Um, we have 1,023 elements in our queue. That, well, what, we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna define a very simple class, price result, and what we're gonna have is a dictionary with, um, with uh, exchange date and symbol, right? So we can keep track of all our prices. It's an important, uh, note here is that I know because I have read about it I've do, done the, the proper research that putting an object in a dictionary in a multi-threaded environment is thread safe because of the current C Python implementation but that doesn't mean that the dictionary is a thread safe collection I am choosing it just because of simplicity in theory to make things thread safe, we should use a thread safe um, collection, which could be also a resulting queue. queue sorry. In a, in a following example, we're gonna actually have two queues, one with the tasks to perform and one with the results or the tasks that are already done. We're gonna use two queues because the, again, they're thread safe. In this case, I'm just using a simple dictionary for the sake of the explanation. And this is the code for our worker. What it's gonna do, it's gonna try getting a task to perform. And in this case, we're gonna do a block false, okay? This is important because we know that all the work has been pre-produced upfront. So all the workers, they can be sure that if they get no element from the queue, if it's empty, then there is nothing else to do. They can just exit, they can just return. But if there is a task to perform, uh, the thread will make the request, check, uh, check the price for that given exchange symbol and date, and it will put the price in that given dictionary. Something else that I know is that there will be no two threads writing the same information because I have not repeated exchanges, symbols, or dates. Again, that's why I can use a dictionary. Once I put the price, I will I'm gonna notify the, the queue, the task queue, that the given task has been done and I will move forward, it's a while through, I will keep repeating until the queue is empty. So we initialize also the results class. 
Now, how many threads are gonna start? Are we gonna start all these threads that are working uh, here in the background? They're pulling from the queue, etc. How many can we start? Well, there are different recommendations. It's something that uh, needs a ton of tuning in order to understand what's the the optimum number of threads in a system. In the concurrent.futures package that we're gonna see uh, in, in seven in the seventh uh, notebook, in this package, the recommended or actually the default number of threads for a pool that we're gonna talk to you about later is either 32 or os.cpu count pl uh, plus phone plus four sorry. So it's the minimum of these two things. Um, I don't know what's the, I don't know, if, I don't know if this is actually times four. We should check it out. They talk about, um, oh no, it's plus four. Okay, so it's either CPU count plus four. So whatever number it's best for you, there is this good um, recommendation here is just about uh, what we prefer. In this case, I'm just gonna set 32, so all the tasks are finishing uh, faster. It also depends on how much memory your computer has. It depends on the nature of the operations, if they are CPU bound or IO bound, something we're gonna talk about also in the multiprocessing one and the GIL one. But for now, 32 is a good number. So I'm gonna create all the threads. I have just created 32 threads. Again, the, what the worker receives is the queue, so it can get a new work to do, a new task to perform, and the results, so it can publish if you want the results when they are ready. I'm gonna start all the threads, and now I'm gonna block on the queue, okay? I'm gonna sit and wait until the queue is empty, basically. I'm gonna wait until all the tasks have been clear from the queue. And that's why we need to publish that with that task done notification. The worker is saying to the queue, hey, I have just finished doing this thing. And once the queue gets back to zero, we know that all the work has been done. The, the task is zero and all the threads have exit, right? Queue is empty, my work here is done, exiting queue is empty. My, my work here is on exiting all the different threads we started, the 32, they have all finished. Um, so that's it, we can check all the prizes we have. There's just uh, a few random prizes you can check there. There you go. There are some, again, that are none, there are more, more decimals, just there you go. So for example, for MX, BT on this date, Ether, we don't have a prize. Again, we have filled all the prizes that we needed with our producer consumer model. So again, uh, uh, the important summary of this part is this is a completely different mental model on, in the way we will design a multi-threaded system. It's still a multi-threaded system, but we didn't need any manual synchronization. That's great because the queue is thread safe and also, we're putting a large number of tasks in this queue and we're creating this pool of consumer threads that are working and we're making sure we're not overloading the system. This is a number you can always tune. The max worker one, you can tune, I don't know where it is. You can tune the number of uh, workers that you're gonna create and you can always keep uh, a, a report, right? Given this number of, of workers, this was the load on the system, CPU, memory, all that, and this was how much time it took, etc. You can keep tuning and perfecting the number of workers. Uh, moving forward, we're gonna see the GIL, which is a very interesting thing in C, Python, and you have probably heard about it already. I am sorry, but you will not like what we're gonna see in this lesson. It's not pretty at all, it's actually one of the major issues with Python, which is the GIL. Um, let's let's get started. I'm gonna try to to make a good introduction here. So just uh, follow me, follow the the tail of uh, when we're gonna hit the GIL. What is the GIL? What's the problem with it, etc. So again, this is just a story for now. Follow my lead. Um, we're gonna try computing prime numbers, or actually checking if a number is prime, and we will try to see a multi-threaded approach for that. So the first thing we're gonna do is define 
the function is prime. Given a number, it's gonna tell you if it's prime or not. Pretty simple so far. I have a list of numbers here, just the file is, you, this file, you can check it out. Uh, list of, uh, let's say, large numbers, I don't know if they're large, but uh, it's gonna take some time to compute if one of these numbers is prime or not, around 0.6 seconds, let's say there is some, some uh, issues here with timing, even I'm in our notebook, etc. So let's say it takes 0.5 seconds, half a second to compute if a number is prime or not. If we have 10 of these numbers, we could expect the whole check, right? To check if all the 10 numbers are prime, it should take around five seconds. So make, let's make a sequential approach, right? As a not multi-threaded sequential approach in which we, che we check if all the numbers are prime or not. And we are gonna expect that it actually took four seconds. It's even faster, four seconds to run this thing sequentially, one number after the other. Um, we immediately see that this is a task that we could parallelize. There are 10 different, there are 10 different thread um, numbers. Sorry, so let's assume, let's say we have four different numbers, so we have 10 actually. And my computer has actually 16 cores. This is literally what I have right here in this computer. But you know, it's pretty common for a computer to have eight, 16, 32 cores. But let's say we have four numbers, I have four cores. What basically I can do is put each CPU, right, to work on each number. And they all work in parallel, right? And the final result is computed in parallel. And how much time this should is gonna take if each one of these takes half a second, right, half a second, and I have 10 of these numbers, it's gonna take half a second because they will all run in parallel. Actually, let's say one of them takes 0.6 seconds, then it's gonna take 0.6 seconds. These ones will be way finished by the time this one is done. So if I can run all these tasks in parallel, that means that the total time is going to be just the time of the slowest task using multiple threads. Again, in the sequential approach, of course, that's not the case because we're checking one number and then the next number and then the next number. So the total time is the sum of all the different uh, individual elapsed times for each one of those numbers. So let's actually write our multi-threaded code and we're going to see right here, this is the way we're gonna run it. It's gonna be, we're gonna create a, a function, check prime worker, which is gonna put the value in a results list only if the value is prime. Remember, a list might not be considered a threads, a thread side collection in, in C Python, we know it is. So uh, this is just for educational purposes. Um, we're gonna create 10 threads, okay? One for each number. Each number is gonna have its own thread. Each number is a task, we could say. So there, are, there's gonna be 10 different threads running this task, and hopefully they are gonna all run in parallel. I have 16 cores, I have a pretty low footprint in terms of resources in this computer. I'm not using anything aside from this notebook and this browser. So this should just go very fast if things go in parallel. So let's see the results. How much the time does it take? Ooh, the final result is 4.2 seconds for the multi-threaded approach. So it seems like all the threads were running concurrently, but they were not running in parallel, okay? The problem here is that we have just faced the global interpreter lock. Python's global interpreter lock. So let me show you first why we have this issue. And then I'm gonna tell you what the gil is. Or actually, let me tell you first, let me explain a little bit better the issue. And in, 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 at the same time, we're gonna understand in a better way what the gil is. So what is the gil? Or what issue are we having? Let's, let's assume again, um, we had we had uh, four three numbers to process three numbers to process there we go so three eight 
and 7. We need to check if these three numbers are prime. In the sequential approach, again, we did first 3, then 8, and then we did 7. The total time of our program was the sum of individual times to check each one of these. That's sequential, we know that. In our multi-threaded approach, right, we have three threads starting, three, uh, thread one, we have thread two, and we have thread three, and we're expecting all these threads to run in parallel, right, let's just all run at the same time, right, and let's say, let's say, um, this one right here takes 0.5 seconds, this one takes 0.6 seconds, and this one takes 0.5 seconds. So this is actually a little bit better. The total time when we process all the threads, we said it was 0.6 seconds. That was the, the expected outcome, right? We were hopefully waiting for everything to be processed in parallel, so each CPU was assigned a number, and everything's gonna finish very fast. But that is not what happened. The final time was 4.21 seconds. What actually happened was that we had these three threads starting and given the gill, the issue with the gill is that in, in C Python, no two threads can run at the same time. So what happened here was that one thread started, started processing, and then before it was finished, it was transferred the ownership to another thread, and then this thread, and then that thread. So at any given period of time, if you get a window of time, there is only one thread effectively running. Even if you have a thousand different cores in C Python, there's only one thread running at the time. Okay, and this is exactly what's happening here. And that makes things even s slower because a thread might be paused in the middle of it. When we were doing our sequential approach, giving each number its f our full attention of the CPU, check if this number is prime, check if this number is prime, and then that one, it, it was faster because each process, right, took care or each, each piece of code took care of finishing before moving to the next one. In this case, you might be partially done and immediately the CPU is actually transferred to this other thread. And all the values you have loaded in the CPU are suddenly cleared out, all the cache, everything, everything is loaded for this thread and then half of the, way, half of the work is done, this thread now is removed and it goes back to you. So you have to load everything back in the CPU and start over. So this is why it's even slower to do it in this way. And the question is, why does Python do this? I mean, why can't we have threads that run in parallel? It's, it's kind of dumb. We're saying we want to do Python threading and to, to speed things up, to run things in parallel, but the reality, the reality is that in C Python, the major uh, Python implementation out there, what you're probably using, you can't run two threads at the same time. There is no parallelism. And the reason for this is it's a little bit more advanced. They have actually linked to this talk right here from Larry Hastings that is very good. It explains why there is a gill in the first place and it explains the importance of the gill. But basically, the gill is Python's global interpreter lock. It's a lock. What we have just seen in our previous lessons, it's a lock. It's helping Python prevent multiple threats to corrupt shared data. Remember, all your threads are running in the same process and they are all sharing the same Python interpreter. Multiple threads can't run in the same, at the same time in the same process because they can potentially corrupt data. Um, that's the reason why we have a gill. The gill, the, the gill is basically 
So we were using as users, as coders, we were using logs to share, to protect our shared data, our variables. We wanted to protect them. So we created our own logs. Well, I want you to know that Python, the Python interpreter also has important shared data. It's going to be seen by multiple threads and the Python interpreter also wants to protect that data. So that's why the interpreter created its own lock right, not the interpreter, coders, uh, C Python core developers, introduce the, the lock in there. So um, we will, two threads will not corrupt that data. Um, so I, I recommend you, I recommend you to uh, check out this talk right here. It's very good. It explains why we have a kill. It actually uh, sets the case for why thankfully we have a gill because that made uh, C Python development uh, development a lot faster back in the day which meant more popularity uh, but again aside from my personal opinion I think this is a very good talk and it's gonna explain why we have the gill so what's going on i mean it's it's like i'm i'm telling you about concurrency you're sitting watching this tutorial about python concurrency and how can we make our programs faster and all that and suddenly i'm telling you you cannot run two things at the same time well there is light at the end of the tunnel there is a final there is a final um there is final hope to all these and it's in resort in the resort of io bound tasks what we did before and let me replay this thing i'm going to change colors here gonna there what we did today was uh we had two threads let's keep it to two threads for simplicity t1 and t2 and what we said was that no two threads could run at the same time right that was the statement so this one here, this one here, they're alternating. They're both running concurrently. Like they are both started at the same time, but they're not, they're, they're not running literally at the same time in parallel. They are switching, you know, uh, execution time back and forth. So this is what we mean by concurrency. Ideally, what we wanted to do is have real parallelism, having two things being processed at the same time. Again, that's not what happens. The code, the, the yeah, the code that is being run here at some point is interrupted and it's shifted. I mean, the, the context is shifted to the second thread. This code was interrupted by the interpreter. It said, hey, leave. Now, no, you can't, you can't run here anymore now share the process share some part of the cpu with that other thread right there the cpu the, or the operating system actually the python interpreter uh, kicks you out of the cpu time and gives uh the window the context to run to another thread this happened because this thread i'm gonna say something in my sound silly why was the thread interrupted the thread was interrupted because it was running this is dumb, right? It's like, why did I um, fall? I fall because I was walking. So if I'm not walking, I will not fall. If the thread is not running, it can't be interrupted. And follow me here. It's a pretty dumb thing what I'm saying. But it's going to make sense in a, in a second. What is happening here is that as this is a CPU bound task, checking if something is prime, the this task the the nature of the task needs cpu it needs as much cpu as it can get cpu 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 finishes with the answer if something is prime or not so as this task is so cpu hungry the interpreter at any point decides to stop it and shifts the context to another thread but that's again because this is a cpu bound task it's a cpu hungry task there are other tasks like for example io tasks that they are short more short-lived bur bursts of work like for example um, if we want to get a prize from this server 
right? We want to get a price from this server. And then we want to do some computation. This task is going to be a little bit more like uh, do some processing, get the price from the, uh, not OQ, get the price from, from the server, wait until it's done, and then do a little bit more processing. This part right here of our algorithm is spent waiting for a result to come from the internet. So when we are waiting, and let's introduce here, I'm going to change the color again so it makes a little bit more sense. Uh, let's put a blue. There you go. Actually, this blue. Here, we're going to have our network. Network right there. I'm going to use black for the rest. So what is happening here is in this sort of uh, do some processing and then get results and wait and then do more processing is that we do a little bit of processing, then we request some information from the network, the network processes and returns, and then we can keep up the work. This period of time here, here, we can't do anything by, but wait. And do you remember from our conceptual lessons when I show you the time that uh, in relative terms, how much time or how much slower a network connection was compared to a CPU con uh, task? Network is very, very slow. Network IO, waiting for a file to be written or read. Um, networking, anything that is I.O. is very slow. So the result here is that we're going to complete out of these here three steps. Step one, do some processing. Step two, get prices from the network and wait. Step three, do more processing. In this scheme, we're going to do the initial process and before we, we ask, we make the, actually not before, but as we make the, the network request, what we're going to do is, is we, this thread is going to inform the Python interpreter saying, hey, I'm going to sit here and wait for some time so you can switch the context to another thread. I am done. So the Python interpreter will now run. It will do this thing, get the request. So here is going to be that. Here we're going to have we're going to have this interaction here, and then here, and then here. Sorry, my drawing is isn't great. But basically, we have sped everything up because the threads are cooperatively waiting for something and they can inform the interpreter that they will not be doing any processing soon. So the interpreter can be shift to some other thread. So this is sort of a, a cooperative multitasking in which the thread informs says, I am doing I am waiting for a network response. I don't need the CPU, move it to some other thread. And, and just check back with me to see if I have the result and I will need the CPU then. So that's why when we run, um, when we run these things in parallel as we did before, the total time to check um, how many exchanges, three exchanges is practically the same as checking one exchange. Checking the price of, of one exchange takes 0.8 seconds Checking three of them is just 0.84, probably just a rounding issue, right? So if I if I run it again every, very fast, well, it was actually a lot faster. I don't know why, uh, but basically, again, the the gill is gonna be a problem, and this is kind of the summary of the whole talk. The gill is gonna be a problem if and only if you are running CPU bound tasks. So this is the moment when you have to start inspecting your code, rationalizing it, reading it, and understanding what type of code you are running. If you have a CPU bound code, thanks to our CPU processing computing, then threads are not gonna be such a good idea. And do you know what is a good idea in that case? That's gonna be multi-processing.
Multiprocessing is the solution for our gel problems. We will be able to overcome the limitation of the gel with multiprocessing, but as we have seen in several occasions during this tutorial, there is no free lunch. So we're gonna win a little bit of a, from some plays with the gill, uh, but we're gonna lose on another. So let's actually talk about it conceptually first. What we did so far was creating multiple threads. We were doing multi-threaded programming. Our Python process, our Python process was creating uh, several threads, spawning several threads, and they were doing work concurrently, right? We said it's impossible for the Python, the C Python interpreter to run multi-threaded parallel code. That was what we were doing before. In this lesson, we're gonna see a way to create multiple processes to run at the same time, right? So we wanna compute three prime numbers instead of creating three threads, we are going to create three processes and each one of these processes will take care of a different thread. The gil was something was created within the Python process to protect shared data in the process. So it was only affecting threads. The gil will not affect multiple processes. We will be able to run multiple processes in parallel. So this is kind of uh, good news. What's the bad news? Well, that processes are a lot more expensive than threads. Creating a process means setting up this whole machinery in the operating system, including allocating RAM, um, memory allocating, uh, f sharing file descriptors, uh, initializing the code, stacks, heaps, all those things we saw in the introduction that are very, very expensive um, before we can actually set up the process work. So it has to be justified if you want to create multiple processes here. Again, by creating multiple processes, we'll overcome the gil. There will be no gil limitations, and we will be actually able to run actual parallel code. If we have multiple cores in our machine, we will see that code is being run in parallel. And that's a good thing. Again, the counterpart is that a process is a lot heavier than creating a thread. So um, let's put it in action. Um, we're gonna create processes of what? One, one important thing, uh, the multiprocessing module is the one we're gonna be using. There is also a subprocess module, you shouldn't confuse that one. It's the multiprocessing one, it's very common to import it as MP, and that's what you're seeing right here. Don't worry too much about it, this is just a detail implementation in, in Mac OS. We have to default back to the fork, a mechanism to keep the code simple. In other case, we'll have to duplicate file scripters and memory and a ton of things. So um, let me show you the process API and let me show you how it works. Basically, to create a process, we are gonna follow pretty much the same API as we did with a thread. We're gonna create an instance of a process that was, again, instantiated from the, the multiprocessing module. And at any moment, we can not start the process and we can check until the process is done. In this case, the process was right there, it was done. Once the process has finished, it's important to close it because remember, it has a ton of resources associated, so it's important to close it. A couple of interesting he things here. The first one is that we are creating the process and we are, let me change the color here. We're gonna go back again to our red. There I go. Um, we are creating the process here and we're passing some piece of code. This piece of code seems to be shared. If these processes are actually completely separated units, how is it possible that this first process as its target gets a reference to the code defined in here, right? If they are independent, isolated. Also, what happens that, I mean, I am, this process is running here, it's doing some work and it's printing, but the output is shown here in my main process. 
Well, the, the concept here, which is a little bit more advanced, but basically by using the fork method that we used at the top, what is happening is that the operating system is duplicating the process. There is this concept of process, process parents and children, and it's a, a, it's a low level um, characteristic of pthreads and some uh, libraries for threading are low level. But basically, we are creating a copy of the thread and it inherits all the code it was defined. So in this case, it was say hello. And also file descriptors IO, I'm gonna put here, these are all inherited and kind of duplicated in uh, the second IO process. So that's why the second process, it's completely independent and isolated, but has copies of pretty much everything we have right here. That's why it can run in the way it runs. Once it finishes, we kill the process, we free up the resources and we move forward. So let's actually do the prime example, right? So um, when I define this function is prime, I'm gonna read all our numbers and then we're gonna, using processes, we're gonna define this very simple function that given a number, it's gonna print if it's prime or not, okay? So we're gonna create 10 processes, one for each one of the numbers. This is, again, you can see it as 10 different tasks and uh, the processes are gonna take care of, we're gonna create one process per task. We're gonna start them all at the same time. We're gonna, we're gonna keep the time, track of the time, we're gonna start them. We're gonna wait until they are all finished and we're gonna see how much time it took. So let me do that very quickly. Everything finished in 0.76 seconds. So this feels parallel. Remember that checking for one uh, prime number or a number if it's prime or not was about five seconds. Running 10 of them was 0.76 seconds, which is pretty good. All right, so now this actually feels parallel. So I'm gonna close all the processes and free up all the resources that we had. Now, um, what you're seeing right here is that I am printing the result because there is no shared data. In our previous example, I was creating a dictionary or a list that was shared data and I was passing that results collection to the worker. The worker could compute the outcome and write in that uh, share piece of data, right? So if I go back here, uh, the share piece of data was here and all threads were putting the results in there. With processes, we can't do that sadly, we can't, because there is no share memory. I mean, there is the, the variables are, and the, the state is not shared. A process is a completely new independent unit. Thankfully, there are a few ways to do that. One of them is with queues. So as we did use the queue method, the queue module, sorry, um, we also have a, the multiprocessing module has a few queues that we can use that are very similar and inspired in the queues that we have already used. And the good news about this is that even though our two, two processes are completely independent, this queue section will be kind of shared so both can read and write from here. They can't, again, I can't change a variable here or I can't change or read a variable here. This is the independent place of each process, but we can create this, this share queue that can be read, read from and written to these two, uh, these two processes. So the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna create two queues. So in our previous example, we created just one queue and then we're, we were using a dictionary to keep track of the results. That's something we can't do here. So we're gonna create two queues, one for work to do and work for work done. And we're gonna prime the queue, the work to do uh, queue by putting all the different um, tasks we wanna perform. In this case, all the numbers that we want to check if they're prime or not. We're gonna find how many workers we're gonna have. So max equals five, just randomly I decided the number. And this is the code that we're gonna run. The, the queue is gonna do, uh, sorry, the process is gonna do uh, task queue dot get no wait. This is a, sim a synonym for get block equals false. And it's also present in the other queue class. I didn't use it before because it wasn't that explicit. Um, once 
we get the number if we get a number we're gonna check if the number is prime and it, and then we're gonna put the result in the results queue result queue dot put this number and this result these can potentially raise an exception which is queue dot empty which means that these here these uh, queue is empty and there are no more results in that case the process will just just finished everything is in this while true as usual so creating the process pool right creating all the processes I'm gonna put them all to work and we're gonna wait until they're over there you go they all finished and in work done we have all the results for all the data so you see how how this queue right acts right here acts as this buffer that we can read from here and we, we can write here we can put things here they can be read here from this process and we can inter exchange information between these two processes in a safe manner there is also the concept of a pipe which is more of like um, process one it's gonna be something like p1 and then we're gonna have like a tube of pipe right the name right and we're gonna have another process and they will be sending messages between them so sending message and sending message here and there um, the standard pipe is bi-directional but you cre can create one that can just have one direction it's perfectly possible and the way it's gonna work is a pipe will have two methods which is receive and send okay um, we're gonna create a pipe which gives you two connections connection on the left side connection on the right side if you want left side and right side in this case I've named them a main because it's my main process and worker and we're, what we're gonna do is define this function that it's gonna receive a number to check if it's prime or not and a pipe connection and once it checks for that it sends a message right sends a message message here saying hey this number and this is the result it's prime or not I create all the processes and I start all the processes and then I can start receiving all the values from this given message actually they were already all published right they were all published I got them immediately but basically I do connection dot receive for a message and I know that I'm waiting for 10 different messages pipes are to be honest not I'm not usually I don't find myself using them so often to be honest they are an interesting tool to know and know it that it's there but I found that they are usually more error prone I prefer to use queues and finally the multiprocessing module has the pull the pull um, sorry the pool multiprocessing pool that basically will let you create multiple processes and send them work to do with a very high level interface without having to deal with the low level um, nuances of shared data in this case we're gonna create a pool of four workers four processes we know that there are four workers created here and I get a reference in pool and then I can do an apply a sync okay just run this thing for me and I'm gonna uh, wait for the result so here it's gonna be the result that get to get the result um, let me just do that two times and we get these two if are, they are done or not I am I am kind of making this synchronous but if you could make we can do something like R1 and let's do here actually let's get this R2 and we can do here for prime is gonna be R1 R2 let's give N1 and 2 2 1 and 1 2 and now it's a lot faster because I'm not doing it um, synchronous again this should have been the original one basically I am creating let's put it in this way to see if it's more clear there we go whatever it's more clear I'm creating the two numbers and then I'm immediately firing them it's like this is not blocking it's just you know forwarding everything to the pool saying 
hey, I, I need you to run this thing. Just get, get started with it. At any point, I can actually put something like time.slip here uh, to print waiting or slipping and now print getting results. Slipping, getting results, and we immediately get the resources were the results, sorry, not uh, resource, the results were provided by the pool. So again, it's like you fire and forget, you get a reference to a result, and once you want to check the result, you just do r1.get. So this is amazing because we're not dealing with queues, with pipes, with anything. There's nothing low level have to deal with, which is fire all the tasks. And uh, they are as they are completed, we're going to get our result. Um, there is another important method in the pool, which is the map method, which is going to basically map uh, multiple uh, a collection, right? with a given callable function and this looks a lot like the regular map method in the standard library or a less comprehension so if we do that we're gonna get very quickly we can process all the values we had before so as a summary usually we're gonna be using multi-threading it's a low it's a lot, uh, I don't know, faster but lightweight to use multiple threads. You can't just fire up a thousand processes because you're gonna completely kill your computer. Threads are lightweight, so we're gonna prefer them. Usually, in our work, uh, I don't know about you, aside from scientific computing, data science, and all that, usual tasks are, are in my experience, they're usually I.O. bound. Right? Usually, most of the time, I find myself creating uh, work, fixing problems in real life that depend a lot on I.O., writing files, writing files, um, writing from network, writing to a network, etc. So, in that case, when threads make a lot of sense, okay? I.O. tasks, remember, they are well suited for threads. But if your task is um, CPU bound, it needs a ton of computing power, then multi-threading will not help you on, on, on the contrary it will make things slower for you so that's why you can resort back to multi-processing but remember creating processes is more expensive so you have to always keep that in mind and um, be conscious of the profiling process of understanding what's the optimal number of processes you can create without crashing your entire system so in, this is so far all the conceptual things we had to see. We, we talked about threats, we talked about the producer-consumer model, we talked about the race conditions, synchronizations, uh, we talked about multiprocessing and why it's important, the, the parallelism with the Python Gill. And now I'm going to show you two libraries that are high level and they're going to let us create uh, multi-threaded or multiprocessing code uh, in a very clean way, all right? And that's gonna be the first one, concurrent.futures, and then the library that I have created, which is parallel. To finish this tutorial, we're gonna see two high-level libraries that are gonna help us, or packages, that are gonna help us um, create more abstract, uh, multi-threaded, or concurrent code, we could say. And the idea here, high-level abstract, the idea is not to get into the internals of creating threads, creating processes, synchronizing them, etc. cetera, uh, have it worked as high level as possible. That's, I think, the objective of um, these libraries. And the, the advantages are clear, right? We, if, we don't, if we don't have to write synchronization code, there is zero chance we actually create a bug in synchronization or a deadlock. If we don't have to create threads and processes manually, there is zero chance we forget to close a process, for example, and clog our computer with unused resources. So as high level as possible. The first one is concurrent.futures. And this one is a Python a built in, this part of the standard library, so you, there is nothing you need to install, just use it. Um, and it has these very neat interface, which is the executor, which will be either thread-based or, or pool-based. You can create either a thread-based executor or a pool-based executor, and uh, sorry, process-based executor. And basically, they both have the same API. There are subclasses. So 
any executor, whatever it is, you can submit tasks, and this is similar to the apply async that we saw in the multi-processing pool. Um, apply async or submit in this case, it's gonna run individual tasks or you also have high level methods as the map one. So let's actually say it in practice, all right? We have this check price function that um, as usual, it's gonna check for a price and return the result. We're gonna instantiate a thread pool executor and run it as a context manager. In this case, I have 10 work workers completely overkill, doesn't matter. And we're gonna submit a task to perform. In this case, check price for these values, these options. And the result is gonna be a future, okay? So this is the major change in the um, concurrent.futures library. It introduced the concept of a future. In this case, the future is an object. We can actually check the interface right here. It's an object that represents some given computation that might be happening at this very same moment. And it has all these different methods, like try to cancel it, uh, check if it's running or not, check if it's done or not, and more importantly, try to get the result out of it. So in this case, once we have the future, the handle, we can do future.result, and we can get the result of the computation. In this case, this is the price. The same thing happens here. If by the time you ask for the result, the task is not done, you're gonna block, right, for until it's actually done. If your timeout parameter was done, if you pass a timeout, it's of course gonna blow up. There is also a very useful, not, I don't know, very useful, it's an interesting method, uh, might be useful to you, which is an add done callback. So it's gonna basically be invoked whenever you finish a result. Um, what else? Um, moving forward, this is again the interface of the result, check if, if the result, if, uh, the future is done or not, etc. There is also a map method, and the map method is interesting because it has a similar API as the, uh, actually the same API as the uh, built-in standard library uh, map method. It receives a callable and a list of things to do. So in this case, I am passing these parameters, exchange BDC and the, pro and the, um, the date for all these exchanges. And we have all the results available right there, right? This is again what we're passing for each one of them. Um, the disadvantage of map is that you have zero flexibility in terms of the parameters you have, you can pass. Um, up there, let's go map. You can always only pass a list of iterables that will be arguments past the function so that we can always only pass that. There's no support for name arguments, there is no support for variable length uh, arguments, etc. It's just very strict. So we can combine the submit method, this is a very common pattern, and a function level, a module level, sorry, function, which is as completed to do exactly this code. And let me walk with, with you through this code. Um, we're gonna submit, we have a list of exchanges, so we're gonna create a dict, a dict comprehension and for each exchange, we're gonna submit a job, right? Or yeah, a task to perform. That is check price, this exchange, this symbol, this date, and the value, it's gonna be the exchange that we actually used. So we're gonna have um, a mapping, a dictionary that is futures to exchanges. So we can then use the ask completed function of these futures we're gonna get for each future as it's completed, it doesn't matter the order, the first one that finishes is result is res results here. It's a it's a blocking um, synchronous function, which it's gonna pretty much return res futures as they are completed, and you can get the exchange given the futures dictionary that we used. So this is involved with uh, the immutable nature of the future that can be used as a key and it can be used to reference it, and we can pretty much do this parameter, this pattern, sorry, we submit and we use it as a key of a dictionary. The as completed function again is returning values as they are finished. So probably if I run this several times, I'm gonna get different uh, order. So Kraken first, Bitfinex, Bitstamp, uh, Bitfinex, Bitstamp, Kraken, it's gonna change the order because it's just gonna return them as they are completed. Again, the, the one that is, done first gonna be returned here and it's just a sequential ordering in there. 
I'm using a producer consumer uh, pattern is pretty much the same thing. So let's move forward with all what we know already. We're going to prime the queue. We have all the tasks in the queue. And here the worker is going to receive as usual a task queue and a results queue, two different queues. It's going to try getting something from the queue. If it's uh, if there is anything else, the queue is empty, it's going to return. In other case, it's going to check the price and put the result in the queue. The way we do it is just we submit a bunch of these jobs or these futures and then we just sit and wait until the queue is uh, the work to do queue is empty. Basically, all the tasks are done. This will finish eventually. There you go. Um, and we can see that the work done queue has all the results. We can pass them all into a results dictionary and use it. So a couple of, of important takeaways here. The first one is that we can completely change the behavior of this code by just changing the name here and saying uh, process pool executor here, process pool executor. If you change just this thing here, you boom, you go from multi-threading to multi-processing in a completely abstract way. Of course, that in this case, we're using um, we are using multi-threading queues, you should change to MP queues. But again, uh, changing the code from multi-threaded to multi-processing uh, multi is as simple as changing this thing. And the second important thing is, as you're saying, we're always using this thing as a context manager, the with syntax, because basically the all the resources used by those threads or those processes will be freed up once the work is done. Okay, so those two are very neat features of this current package. What I can say here is if you have to, and this is a very important summary of the whole tutorial, if you can start, uh, if you're going to do something that needs either multi-threading or multi-processing, I will recommend you first to try using the concurrent.futures library. It's built in, it's bulletproof, it's been around for a long time, it's and it's very high level okay you don't need to manually synchronize anything so try to get it done with um concurrent.futures first if that doesn't work then you can move to low level threading or multiprocessing but first i think the first the the main uh, the, the main reasoning has to be i will try to do this thing with multiprocessing first so uh let's move to the sec second library which is um a library that I have created, so um, it's uh, parallel. It's available on GitHub. You can install it very quickly with just pip install Python parallel. And what I tried doing in this library was improving the map methods, and there are a few others that I am not showcasing here, but the sync map, a few methods with um, more flexibility. In this case, the function parallel.map, I didn't define the function, the parallel.map uh, receives a function and receives a list of uh, it, iterables and potentially extras to pass. And what it does, it runs everything in a multi-threaded environment by default, except if you change here the executor to be um, multi-processing instead of uh, multi-threaded. So you can change very quickly the executor you are using with a simple keyword argument. I've also put a ton of uh, emphasis on good error handling. So basically, you can pass name parameters or optional arguments for this. I'm gonna, on purpose, I'm gonna break this execution. I'm gonna change the base URL and this will not work. It's just gonna break. So every, every other parameter here is gonna receive base URL equals this. This one right here will define, will receive base, equals, base URL equals eight, port 8000. And this is gonna break. If I run dot, you're gonna see it just breaks. But we have included a parameter which is silent, silent, sorry. So you can we can keep uh, errors silenced, get the result of the execution, and we will see here that bitstamp, the variable bitstamp here, is a failed task. So we have this failed task ex um, abstraction which will let us understand why the code failed what were the parameters and why it failed. This is the idea of the fail task. So if you're interested in high level parallel computing, just 
check out the library. Again, my recommendation, and we can use this as a whole summary, is try to use concurrent.futures first. And this is it. We've reached the end of the tutorial. Please keep an eye on the updates for exercises and projects that we will be posting. It's going to be important to practice what we've seen. And as a quick summary, uh, we can do kind of a, a, a dirty checklist on all we've learned and how we can place it or how we can organize it in our mind. I want you to have the, the main purpose of this tutorial is for you to understand when to use each tool and how to use each tool and what it means to use a given tool. Um, the easiest thing is to say, let's just use multi-threading always. But we know that's not the answer. If our, if our task is CPU bound, that's not going to work. And, and we know how many, and even if we decide threads, we're going to say, oh, let's use the threading module and create threads by, our, by ourselves. And then we start with all the synchronization issues we saw that can uh, raise conditions, deadlocks, etc. So again, the most important thing is to understand the concepts and hopefully for you to understand when to use the right tool for the job. First, do you need to write multi-threaded or multi-processing code at all? Maybe you don't have a multi-threading problem. You have to use a job queue, as we saw at the beginning, or you have to use something like a big data architecture like Dask or Spark, right? So first of all, do you need multi-threading? Do you need multi-processing? Then if you want to move forward, then realizing if it's a CPU-bound task, multi-processing, or if usually the case, an IO bound task, in that case, you're going to have to use multi threading. Once you have defined it all, define all that, you need to run concurrent to write concurrent code, you need to use, for example, multi threaded, let's say, then starting work backward or, or, or downwards, right, the arc, the levels of abstractions of the libraries you have, can you use a very high level library that completely abstracts you away from the fact that you're creating multiple threads, abstracting you away from synchronization, deadlocks and all that. If that's available, that's great. Actually, it's available. It's concurrent.futures. Actually, I'd say I recommend you to use concurrent.futures concurrent as much as possible because it's built in, it's in the standard library, it's bulletproof, it's just a lot of eyes are, are set on that library and it's proven to work fantastically. So if you can start there, high level concurrent.futures, then you start saying, my problem is getting more complicated. Can I switch to a different library like parallel? Can I, can I use something that it's high level, but it's a little bit more powerful? And if I can't, then start going down, you know, to, to the threading package, but always being conscious of the issues, you know, the doors you're open and the issues you might face. So again, the most important thing about multi-threading, multi-processing and concurrent programming is understanding when you need to create concurrent software and what problems that will involve. So thank you very much. If it's been a, a wonderful experience and let's get in touch in Twitter, uh, any other medium, it's actually mainly Twitter. Um, hopefully we'll see you in the next PyCon.